Well, hello everyone, and welcome to today's session on Salesforce CPQ by IntelliPad. Salesforce CPQ is a native Salesforce tool designed for sales teams to create more accurate and highly personalized quotes. It provides centralized access to all the products, services, available prices, and customer data of your company, allowing a notable increase in productivity. CPQ Salesforce or Configure Price Quote Software by Salesforce is a sales tool for companies to provide accurate pricing with any given product configuration scenario. In this session, you will learn all about Salesforce CPQ. So without further wait, let's check the agenda for the session. So first we'll be talking about introduction to Salesforce CPQ, then basic sales processes and traditional quoting processes. After that, we'll be talking about CPQ licenses, Salesforce CPQ setup, and configuration of different products in Salesforce CPQ. So that's all with the agenda. Now let's start the session. But before we begin the session, make sure to subscribe to our channel and press the bell icon so that you'll never miss any update from us. So cool. As I was mentioning, right, uh, CPQ is more of an advanced or specialization, right? Um, this has a prerequisite of the sales process priorly, okay? By uh, each and every company, right, which is engaged in some kind of a sales activity, okay, irrespective of what, whatever uh, domain it is, right? any kind of a sales activity, that uh, this CPQ tools can, can or cannot, it can fit in, but it would be something related to sales only. Okay, They might put some kind of a manual discounting based on the customer. Right? Okay, so the customer who is a very loyal customer has been uh, uh, our customers uh, for years then okay he is eligible for some kind of a discounting or maybe that particular customer has some kind of a contract pre-agreed contract with our company so then i can put some some discounting process over there okay hoping not to make kind of an error now once they put in kind of a discount right that discount needs to be reviewed specifically the ones which are like beyond certain threshold right that uh, some senior manager or senior executive, sales executive, they would like to review with that, okay, why this particular uh, customer we are giving so and so discount. Okay. And finally, this quote is uh, is approved, okay, and uh, we put down everything in the quote. Now, the quote generation, right, also, uh, we used to have some kind of a word processing system, right, in which we used to lay down this quote, okay, this is the quote. Uh, these are, which would contain some basic information about the customer, like for example, customer details, who is the contact with that particular company, what kind of products they are interested in, what is the price, some kind of this process, right? So this is this used to be a traditional quoting process. Now, just if I were to uh, extend this one, right? If I see some kind of a challenge, is like okay, what would be the general challenge over here? If you see, if I have this kind of a spreadsheet, suppose for maintaining the prices and all. Right. Suppose the prices gets updated. How many spreadsheets I need to update? Okay. When somebody sales is referring the spreadsheet, I don't know whether that spreadsheet is updated or not. Whether he's referring the correct or updated spreadsheet or not. If suppose let let's say he's not updating the uh, latest prices, then what would happen? He would make errors on the quote, right? Which would have a commercial impact. If he's uh, if he's uh, putting quoting a lower amount, then it would have a commercial impact on the particular company. And if he's putting a higher amount, then the customers won't agree to that. Or if he has given a lower amount and then say back to the customer, hey, sorry, uh, it was my blunder that okay, I I messed up over there, and and this is the amount. So again, some kind of a to just to give a to make customers understand we need to give some kind of additional offers or some kind of freebie to have that kind of thing, but which again doesn't give a particular good customer experience one would expect again and then coming down to this this process right over here in which we are giving the quotes to the customer and uh, using some kind of a word process which again there is no standard or formalized uh, i would say content and branding now nowadays every company is very uh, peculiar about their brand about their content right which they are rolling down to the customer right 
So all these challenges were there, right? If you see that this could be the basic challenges uh, each company or each sales process would have, right? Now, considering these challenges or this traditional quoting process, this CPQ tool has been built that how a CPQ tool, right? can be uh, used to address these kind of a traditional challenges, right? And the, see, the basic motto of the CPQ or basic objective of the CPQ tool is to uh, fasten the sales process so that they can uh, quickly do the sales and without error, more effectively, okay? And they have more productivity over there, right? So that that is the whole uh, concept of CPQ comes in that, okay, that, Salespeople, they should focus on selling, but they should not focus on the logistics like, okay, is the product is correct, is the prices are correct, whether I'm using the right content, what content should I put. So their time should or effort should not go over there. Rather, their focus should be getting more and more business productivity. Okay. I hope um, with this explanation, I was able to explain that why or how a CPQ tool comes to rescue. Okay. Um, moving further, right? CPQ, what and why it, uh, I think I mentioned about the why piece of the CPQ, right? What is a CPQ? CPQ stands for an acronym for Configure, Price, and Cook. Okay. Now, uh, I just, with this concept map, right, I just wanted to uh, show that how these challenges, right, with the CPQs, Configure, Price, and Code, three independent modules over there, right, how they relate to that and how this tool would help you to uh, Address those challenges. Okay, configure first. Thing. What is configure? Configure is nothing. Basically, what the product, what products does the customer want to buy? Right, that is nothing but a configure. Now, uh, figuring out his products. Okay, with the CPQ in with the CPQ tool in place, right? It's very easy, or uh, a sales won't have to uh, think about that. Okay, what products are related products? So, what are the one products? Okay, with this product, what con what combination of products can we recommend? Okay, so these all parts, right, is taken by the configuration part of the CPQ. So in CPQ, right, we can define certain uh, kind of a business tools or the technical tools in which we would try to address all those kind of a challenges. Coming to the price part of it, this consulting of the spreadsheets and all, and discounting, automating, and reviewing these kind of things, all this effort is saved with just the pricing part. The CPQ out of the box support I think four or five kind of a pricing. Okay, we can use that one, or we can anyways. We can have our uh, if those doesn't fit the business model of the particular company, we can go for a customized piece. But once we have this in place, uh, place right, this all this effort right of of updating this one of the automatic discounting, everything is taken care of within CPQ. Once we have all the configuration stuff. Now the final piece of coding. Right. As I was mentioning, right, uh, the challenges for the coding process. Uh, what are the different challenges about the branding, about the content, about the formalized approach, all the like look and feel of the documents which a company is sending out to, um, to the customers outside, right? So everything is taken care of by the coding. We have in CPQ, which basically some kind of a templates we can say, we can uh, configure, which can be reused again and again, right? So that all challenges have been addressed. And quoting is nothing again coming back to how the deal is presented to the customer. The deal details about the sales, right? Mm -hmm. About the quoting piece. And if you think from an ERP level also, right? So this is speaking about uh, basic process. Where if you think about ERP process or maybe a company or a firm which is uh, spread across globally. So it's not about what. Um, they don't deal in one currency or maybe in one language, right? So one company who is based out of APAC was based up in Europe as well, uh, uh, in America as well. So they would be transacting in that local currency. Suppose everything is just going out in Europe, it goes in euros, bank, pound, everything like that, right? Then APAC, we have different currencies. So all this complexity keeps on rising as, as the firm is the more, the larger, the better global firm it is. Right, so then these processes could really come in hand. Again, with the coating also, we can have the coatings uh, enabled in different languages as well, so that within each region we have the appropriate language code for the way. Is that clear? So again, coming back to this benefits, right? I was just mentioning all the challenges. 
which basically we have covered is that what are the benefits once we have the CPQ in place, right? Focus on customers during sales without price discounting and promotions. Okay, more, basically uh, more focus on the past, uh, sales. Okay, eliminate price and contract errors due to predefined rules and templates. Increase the productivity of team to close more deals. Okay, standardize proposals. Okay, quick creation of the code using the predefined template and again in different languages supporting different currencies. So these are the few benefits I could say about the CPQ process once we have in place and which addresses all those challenges which we had earlier. Okay, I hope this one is clear. I just wanted to well, showcase some kind of a... Okay, now um, since we've gone through all the uh, processes that, okay, uh, what is CPQ, what is a, or what kind of a, what kind of a, I would say challenges this CPQ tool solves, right? We are all in agreement in that one. So now let's go uh, further and see how the typical CPQ life cycle goes. Firstly, like as I mentioned, right, leads, leads would be there, but some processes, or I would say not all companies would, or all the processes would start with leads. Maybe some, there are companies, uh, or uh, maybe in some transactions, right, we're dealing with the company or we're dealing in a scenario which we have already a customer, right? So I would go and create a lead order. So basically, we have already a customer and a contact in place. I would go and create an opportunity for it. Okay, that's my basic thing. I have the opportunity, I have the needs of the customers as part of the opportunity. Now, once the opportunity is created, basically, then the next step would be the product configuration. The, the product needs, basically, the, a customer is required, right? We will do all the configurations part and we would add all those things as part of the configuration. After this one, um, we have the, we have, once we have configured all the needs or all the products, right? Then we would have the pricing and discounting uh, that would happen up. Now pricing and discounting, again, all the products which we have added, right? Based on some rules, like for example, this is a customer, then okay, he's eligible for this and this discount, or maybe it can be a volume-based discounting as well. Like if he's, it's doing a bulk purchase from us that we can afford to give some kind of a discounting over there. So such kind of a, either you can say a business rules, technical rules that we can configure. Once we are done with this piece, right? Then we create a code and proposal out of it. Now, once all these things are documented as part of the codes, right? now again, there's a step of electronic signature, which usually nowadays it's a trend. I would say that most of the companies, they are using some kind of an electronic signature uh, mechanism because this helps to increase the throughput of the sale. CPQ, uh, sales for CPQ, right? They support tools like um, DocuSign or the Adobe eSign for this kind of your piece, it's electronic signature. Um, in this, basically, I just wanted to let you know how it works is that you have generated a document out of Salesforce, right? Now, you send the document for signing to your customer saying that, okay, hey, uh, this is what we discussed. These are all the terms and conditions. These are all the things. Uh, please, uh, if you agree with all those things, please request to sign and then confirm an order from us. Right? So that would be a very good like uh, experience as well. Okay, And it would fasten up the process as well. So that I have, it's with me, for example, it's coming to me and says, if you're saying, I just put a sign, there will be a link, just putting a sign out of it. And once it is signed, all the parties, all the necessary parties who are configured, they have given the confirmation. But we have a, a confirmed code, okay, which again would go back to Salesforce. We can configure it, whether it sits on opportunities or uh, whether it sits on code, anywhere, whatever we like, we have things. Now, once we have all this confirmation, right, then we go with the next step of the order. Then creating an order out of the code stretch, which we have created, ordering it, then doing a contract out of it. So once we have a contract, that contract would be nothing but uh, a mutual agreement between both the parties, right? Okay, these are the products you're purchasing for this, for this and this term. This is the prices we agreed, all those kind of details. Right? Now, next step, uh, once we have a contract, right, what would happen? Like, let's say it's a one-year deal, right? After six months, something happened. Like maybe, uh, let's say I ordered 12 laptops from a company, right? But... Uh, Maybe there's a surge in the business and I require more laptops because there will be no more people joining my, my team. So I can I requested the other company that, okay, hey, I have already an existing contract with you of 10 laptops. Can you please amend it to add five more 
So such kind of a scenario, right? Such flexibility is also the CPQ uh, tool provides. That you can you can put some amendments, okay? And uh, the better part is you don't have to focus on all these calculations. Once you have your configuration correct, right? You charge only these things. Otherwise, in general terms, right? You could see in traditional process if some scenarios like this happen. What would happen is that okay, uh, if you ask me amendment, then I need to figure out that okay, what was something I told him? This is the price. Now he wants additional five uh, quantities on top of it. I need to give adjust that one for only five and maybe make the contract for one year itself. So basically, this second piece uh, or the amendment piece is active for the rest of the six months, like that. Some some complexity that that, that is this CPQ tool, right? It eases up that one. And finally, um, if you're dealing with some kind of a subscription as well, then we go for the renewal part also, right? Just to make uh, things more, uh, keeping the lights on, right? Keeping things rolling with the customer that if you're just checking when the, these are the existing contracts you have with us, so do you want to renew it or maybe make some amendments for the next cycle? And again, finally, for this renewal contract, again, we have a renewal opportunity, renewal code. The same cycle starts. So uh, this is a pretty much a high level life cycle of the CPQ. Okay. And all this one right over here, which is mentioning about the single data set, single data model, and one customer view. It helps basically this tool, right? They help to integrate uh, or give an entire end-to-end -end 360 degree view of the customers. Okay, that when they can when you need to or when somebody uh, needs to see this customer's portfolio, right? They would get all the data. Okay, this customer has so and so contracts, active contracts with us, they're already opting for these products. Basically, they helps to uh, create more kind of a upselling or cross-selling opportunities as well. Okay. And all this one, right, all this, all this complexity, basically, this is handled within the single uh, data model and data and object model of the CPC. Okay. There are different objects and entities which would help you to achieve all the objects. Okay. So uh, for CPQ, right, I would request you to Please all sign up on this um, URL. Okay. The reason I'm asking for you to spin up a new sandbox, a uh, new box, basically developer off, is this URL right gives you a developer edition with the CPQ package installed. There is a predefined data setup within this, and the package license definitely would be uh, active for 90 days. Next time, 90 days. So this would come handy instead of using the existing edition. I wanted to share the information about the CPQ license. Like I was mentioning about the Salesforce one, right? We have full CRM license, which would give you the sales cloud, uh, sales cloud, service cloud, basic marketing cloud as well. You can use the features, workflows, process builders, and other kind of uh, the tools which have been set up after the process. Right, the Salesforce license does that. Again, platform licenses, there are limitations that you won't be having the application of full CRM capabilities for the sales uh, for the sales cloud and the service clouds, right? So in order to get that for the platform, you need to build all those things. You won't be able to leverage out. On the similar note, um, for CPQ also, I hope my PPT is clean visible. Perfect. So uh, for CPQ also, we have four variants. Okay. Now CPQ, this CPQ, right, Salesforce, I would say maybe last or last year and a half ago, uh, they have introduced a billing package as well. Okay. The Salesforce have they introduced a billing package. I don't remember the name of the company they acquired. Basically, it was that. So they renamed CPQ. They call it more of a revenue cloud right now, okay, which, which consists of both the CPQ as well as the billing package. So that's why earlier uh, it used to offer the licenses in two variants only, the CPQ and the CPQ Plus variant. CPQ which costs around $75 and the CPQ Plus which costs around 150 Now, what is the difference between these two? I, I think you can see there's an advanced approval and order management, I would say, bundle within the CPQ product. And most of the CPQ implementations which I have seen, right, the sales for CPQ, they the, try to use the advanced approval. They don't go with the standard approval processes, which you might have gone in the admin classes, right? So this is slightly different, more robust, more scalable, okay? So it's a separate package comparatively to what the CPQ package is there. So if you have the CPQ plus license, it covers that as well. But if you are 
going with the CPQ, then there's an additional price for that type of thing. to use that auto management as well as the advanced approval. So that is there. And then some features about this uh, usage based pricing, which uh, I would explain that what is the usage based uh, products and all. So that comes in the CPQ plus. But again, to use some of these features, right? Completely, you need to have the billing packages also involved, installed basically on your orgs. Um, so that's how about the licensing thing. Okay. So uh, just to give you some history, Salesforce, right? I think it started around 2008 or 9 as yeah, a CRM product just with the sales cloud. It didn't have any sales cloud. And uh, slowly and gradually, as you guys are aware, right, there are three releases every year for Salesforce. The, and it kept on acquiring a lot of companies. In 2016, I believe there was a company named called Steelbrick. Earlier, the CPQ package, right? It doesn't need to come like this. So you need to go to the app exchange, install the package uh, from Steelbrick CPQ, and that's how you used to get this one. That was a paid version. So in 2016, they got that acquired company, and they, it was an earlier to use called Steelbrick. Now, again, Salesforce is coming up with their branding on top of it. So that's why a lot of people are uh, aren't aware of it. So once we are done with this, um, you get login into Salesforce, right? The first thing you can check is the CPQ is Type in over here. You can see in the apps also. But over here, there is an application there. Salesforce CPQ. Okay. So that's the one way to check if the CPQ package is there. Second way, what? You can definitely go to setup, okay, and all the packages which are there are comes under the install pack. If you go over here, you might see this one: Salesforce CPQ, this version number, this name prefix, active and limited, all those kind of things. This is the second way to check. Okay, so what I want everyone, okay, the first step are can they go to install packages and go to CPQ, this one. And over here, right, you can see a button called configure. You can just click on that. And once you click on this, there are tons of activities, tons of tabs like this. It will be coming up. Okay. Um, over here, right, in the first fifth tab, pricing and calculation, you might see a small, uh, just beneath this legacy calculator, this small link, use new calculation service. So this is a screen grab of how things would be looking at your end. So this, there are different uh, concepts in this one. Okay, we'll start with the products and bundles. Okay. And uh, so uh, once we are into the CPU package, right, we go to this install package, click on configure, and a lot of settings out of the box comes in. So this is the this is one of the steps basically we need to do the legacy uh, uncheck the legacy calculator and authorize the new service because Salesforce um, they have a new pricing which uh, has been created and this is committed to stop support for the legacy calculator. So all the orgs which were using they also have to migrate to this new calculation services. Okay. <clears throat> now uh, coming to the Salesforce package, this setting right there are. Like you can see there are a lot of tabs within this and each tab would consist of some kind of a settings within it. So just to uh, just remember one thing that this setting, right, whatever we are doing it is, it's not any kind of a user specific or whatever we do, it has to imply across the orgs. Okay. So it is the foremost thing that the some of the settings which we will go through okay, in a few minutes that they are very critical and we need uh, whoever the customer, the business consists is that uh, are we on agreement that all the codes or all the pricing would be based on this and so and so attributes would be used. Okay, So that is one thing we need to uh, firstly clarify and then set this up because this is an all point thing. I hope I am clear on that one. So let's go with the first uh, tab, the documents tab. Okay. So in this one, uh, we'll cover some of them and some of them I'll keep on uh, park it for now so that once we cover that particular session, right? So that you're able to relate it, okay? That why this setting is coming up. So some of the major ones which are generally used, okay? We'll cover it uh, right away. 
So for example, this document tab under this document tab, right? You can see the document folder, the attachment target. Document folder is nothing but as I was mentioning, right? CPQ out of the box, they have the capability to uh, create the code documents, right? You can create the code documents, which I was mentioning about the branding, the formalized content and everything, right? Now this document, which is getting created, right? Where does it store in CPQ? There might be some kind of a folder, right? Or some kind of folder structure where these documents, which we are generating out of the CPQ, this, that is this document folder. It's user personal document. It's, this is nothing but, you remember the document object, um, which is still not there in Lightroom, by the way, uh, it's storing under those. Okay. You can have this one, or when you install this, um, what do you say? CPQ package, right? You would have different others as well. Let me just quickly remind you. Guys. This is the document folder. Okay, this you might have seen in your earlier in the presentation. Also, nothing. Just a quick info, guys. Intellipad provides Salesforce online training mentored by industry experts. The course link is given in the description below. Now let's continue with the session. Thank you over here. So these are the few folders which gets created when you install this CPQ package. Okay. So in the package, I was just mentioning that okay, what whosoever is doing it. For example, I'm a CPQ admin. If I'm doing, I can go into my person. All these documents get stored over here. Okay. So that is one thing. I hope this document object is clear. Okay. For other ones, for example, the attachment target. Basically, the documents I was saying, right, uh, which is generated, it can be documents only, or there's an option of you can store it in quotes or opportunities. Quotes and opportunities, how it would get stored is there is a notes and attachment section, which is out of the box uh, standard Salesforce CRM object, notes and attachment. So you can, if you put that, uh, set that setting right. You can see the document code document which is generated in the course of the opportunity as well. Okay, hide the document name. Some some companies basically they don't want or they don't want to give the flexibility to the users to write the document name. Okay, so in this case, then they can uh, hide the document or maybe it be locked so that the user are not able to edit it. Then. Um, these are like full page preview, which when we see in the uh, code document, we'll see that. Then, one important thing I was mentioning about, right? Like, if these CPQ packages, right, they are getting installed or they're getting used in, uh, in companies which are based across different regions, right? You have the option to enable the multilingual translation. So, when you enable this, right, there are certain objects which get opened up, okay? For example, the translation and localization in which you can basically mention uh, the translations captures them and once you have configured them then you can uh, review the document in that particular line so that is enable multi language tracking i think these settings are okay with this should i move forward then coming to this groups group solution group there's a feature in salesforce cpq solution groups uh, in which some companies they do have a standardized way of grouping the code lines right for example if they're adding different uh, products within the code, right? You can group them, like maybe uh, just to give an example, the hardware products in one category, software products in one category. If every code has this kind of a, if they, uh, the business would demand something like this, right? Then we enable a solution group. Otherwise, we have different other tools as well, like for example, code line groups and all, which would uh, help you to solve the challenges. This was Group's line editor, okay? Um, Line editor in in CPQ, right? There are uh, okay, I'll just cover this one a little later. Then it would be making more sense. Plugins, plugins. Okay, this is interesting. So um, whatever the CPQ provides out of the box capabilities, that is there. Now, if this can this they don't have lim uh, the Salesforce, they don't have limited this to this one because CPQ as a whole, right, it's a vast concept, right? And as big as the companies uh, is, right? There are a lot of other things to manage. Okay, so they have given the flexibility for this CPQ package to integrate with the other uh, other different uh, features as well. For example, as I mentioned, the electronic signature plugin, right? So if you're using a DocuSign or maybe the Adobe Sign, right? Uh, if you install those packages, they give some plugins you need to configure over here. The CPQ would integrate with that. Okay. Or if you suppose have a, suppose some kind of a custom product service plugin, you don't like the way the CPQ 
does the product search right out of the box. You can design your own plugins or there are some, uh, I would say, um, external integrations you can develop, right? All those plugins you can capture with it. This is there uh, to keep on uh, enhancing this plugin, the recommended one, right? Nowadays, uh, recommended product plugin that is also one of the hot features of the CPQ. Recommended product plugin is, um, I think everybody uses Amazon, right? When we try to put something into cart, right? There's a section in which uh, downside when you do it. People who bought this have also bought this, right? Where you say that, okay, you bought this one. Okay, people, if you're saying you're buying a laptop, there's a laptop, fancy laptop bag, or maybe a, uh, something other product, right? These are kind of a re recommendation products, right? This is more of an up upselling strategy for the company. Right? You can build um, standard also uh, Salesforce. The Salesforce, they have some plugins where you can design and uh, you can use some objects to do that. Else, now you can um, use this fancy AI or ML capabilities also to develop some kind of an integration, then integrate within this CPQ. So those kind of a plugins right over here, that can be used. Document store plugin, for example, some, some companies, they're not storing documents over here. They're using some kind of an external service, for example, Amazon, right? They're pushing all the documents so that they don't, the space, right? Storage space within the CPQ or in the Salesforce specifically, they don't get uh, vanished easily. They have huge ton of documents. So they purchase that one. You can create a plugin and store all the documents which are generated over there. So some, 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 some kind of plugins are over there. Okay, so this is basically the extending the capability or scale from a scalability standpoint of view. Uh, Salesforce has given these this these two tabs are very crucial. Pricing and calculation. Okay. Um, firstly, let's go with this unit price scale over here. What does it do signify? If you uh, if you hover on this info bubble, right, it says that enter the scale for the unit prices. Fraction price will be rounded off to the this many decimal places. So basically all the currency fields, right? So whatever the currency fields you're using, we need to agree that it would be displayed up to two decimal places. So this is again, as I was mentioning earlier, it's an org wide setting. So this needs to be consistent with the business stakeholders. But we need two, uh, two decimal points, one decimal, three decimal, whatever. So that configuration happens over here. Okay. It's, it's similar to what uh, I think in, you guys are aware of this. You create a number field, right? You have the option to enter the decimal decimal places also when you create a number field. It's similar to that. Exactly similar. Other settings over here, for example, this calculate immediately. Um, this one is, I would say, is to give more of a real time calculation on deadline page. Like once we are into this quote lines, right? I would show you that how what is a quote line editor, how the pricing comes in with this one. Okay, so generally it is recommended to uncheck this, okay, because of uh, for the QLE performances, right? This is uh, this is to give you a more of a real time calculation. If you have the needs, okay, definitely go ahead and enable this one. But sometimes, uh, if some orgs, right, they have a complex implementation, okay, so then it is recommended to have this switched off, okay, so that the QLE doesn't perform. Uh, then we have this enable quick calculate. What is this one? Again, if you check this one, this this is a, I would say very impactful, this one. It is highly recommended we don't do it. Reason being, because once we check it, right, it doesn't calculate the price rules. In CPQ, we go ahead with uh, something called price rules, which are uh, designed for some kind of an automating of the prices, okay? Doesn't consider the roll-up summaries and formulas. Uh, field which is depending upon the parent plan. So if you, if an organization or if the organization implementation doesn't have these things, then only go ahead. Otherwise, it is strongly recommended that we enable this one. Okay. Um, Usage-based pricing, again, as we're showing you right in the licensing, there's a, there's a product type, I would say, okay, which is a usage-based. Uh, based on whatever usage you are doing, then uh, you would be charged accordingly. If you want to enable that one, you have to do this again. But this with the CPQ alone package, this, this implementation is not that much complete over here. Uh, we have something called as uh, legacy calculator is mentioning that this has been disabled. So that's that's there. You need to enable that one. Subscriptions and renewals. This is also an important 
tab over here, there are different uh, renewal models, basically two renewal models, contract based and asset based. Okay. What this two means is like uh, contract, think of something like this, why or a contract is something which is for only for your subscription products, right? So why you would renew a contract? Or if you have a something product, right, which is a one-time purchase, if you bought a laptop, you are not buying a laptop every year, right? But if you have a subscription, for example, you have a subscription to Prime or this Netflix, right? You keep on increasing your subscription, right? So you keep on changing your uh, contracts. So this renewal model is exactly the same thing that most of the cases which I have seen, it's mostly the contract based because nowadays most of the companies they're going more towards the subscription and, and the usage based model as compared to only to the asset base. Asset base is nothing but um, the products which you buy uh, one time basically. So if you want, if you have the product catalogs, if you're something you're dealing in the product catalog, which is more of a uh, non-subscription base, then it is recommended that you go with asset based model. Okay, uh, precision, prorate precision. This is an interesting concept again um, and very, very important. CPQ, uh, I hope till this point of time, any questions anyone has for us here? These two fields over here, right? The subscription term unit and subscription prorate precision. So suppose one, suppose I gave an example of a subscription product, right? What is a subscription product? For example, Netflix. We buy a subscription for one year. Okay. For example, we have a product in product, we have something called a subscription, default subscription term, right? Which is basically a number field. There's nothing over there. Okay. You enter one, two, three, four, five, six, whatever. But how would one know that? Okay, what does that one signify? Is it a one month, one day, one year? What what it what it is? From this setting, right, you understand that okay, whatever or however the products which we would be con configuring within CPQ, when we configure the subscription term, that signifies 12 months or days. We have only two units over here, months and days. Okay. Now, uh, suppose if I configured a product for 12 months to be costing around $120, right? One product for 12 months is costing us yes, $120. My customer doesn't have, or maybe he needs uh, this product only for half a year, six months, or let's say two years. What do you would do? Whether you would Calculate okay for 12 months it's $120 for two years, how much it could be two for six. Proration it is you think right the proration that okay for 12 months is configured as 120 for 24 months it could be two for six. That proration happens. What is this precision with this setting? Okay, the pro subscription prorate precision. CPQ already have this capability of doing this proration. So that is one of the USP of CPQ that you don't have to worry about it. Provided you are aware of these settings that, okay, there are different, like for example, when you select month, right, there are different product procedures, which we'll go just now, day, calendar, month, plus daily, day with calendar, a month weighted, month, and month daily. Okay. And once and once we have this one, right, the day, we have only day only. Okay. All those other procedures go away. Okay. And now what? these individual precision means, right? That, okay, once you have selected, suppose month, right? Now I have to select the precision, uh, prorate precisions. For this one, I have an interesting slide. I'll just, okay. So as I was mentioning, right? That for example, my subscription term is month. And what is, these are my proration methods available. What does each, each of these means? Okay. This, the first column represents the methods which we were seeing in the package. Okay, then second is showing actually the math, what how CPQ does the calculation behind, and this is an example of how the flow rate multiplier would be oh, sorry, is calculated. Okay, so let's say uh, my proration precision is set to month. Okay, my term is month. Now, what would happen? Let's say I have a customer who is asking me for a subscription based product for from Jan 20, 10, 2020 to April 15, 2021, okay? With 12 months DST, DST is nothing but default subscription term, which we would configure on that particular product, okay? Now, suppose uh, this 12 months, th this product is costing is, we have configured on the product as for 12 months, this product would be costing you $120. Now he wants this particular uh, 
duration, right? Which rounds up to, I think, fifteen point something, okay, fifteen fifteen months, some some days, okay. So CPQ, what it does is, it would do the rounding up of this one, fifteen point something goes up to sixteen divided by twelve, it's always TST, which is like proration multiplier of one point three three. So your actual price for this duration for the one which is having configured as twelve. Ah, uh, one twenty dollars for twelve months would be one twenty into this pro rate multiplier. I hope first example is clear. Okay, so this is how the pro rate multiplication is happening. Now let's see how the other other ones are also getting configured in this one. So for example, we have month and daily. Right? What does this mean? Is this is giving you a better precision? Like okay, months, the whole month would come up. Whatever the remaining days is there, this is divided by this, and finally it is divided by this TST. So for this duration again, considering this, it is 15 months plus six days. Okay, which is if you do this calculation, then in this example, the first month spans from this to this, the last month spans from this to this. It comes out to be this kind of a pro rate multiplier. Okay, this is again. A discussion with the with the stakeholders just to understand what or tell what kind of precisions they want on their prices. Okay, this is a standard thing, so this needs to be understood very carefully. Uh, all the business also needs to understand this is how they. Because this is once it is done, okay, it's going to be like this. But if you later point of time, right, during the implementation, the later point of stuff, you changing this, this would screw up your all like anything. All your pricing logic, all everything would get disturbed. Okay, so this is very crucial over here. Again, the third one. Uh, initially, when sales, I think this, this one, this one, and this one, uh, sales was added maybe two releases back, uh, in spring eighteen or something. Uh, because again, for this different precision level, this is nothing but uh, different precision level. For this calendar monthly plus daily, it is again this partial days in start month. Divided by days in the start month, this whole month, partial days in the end month, and divided. Days. So, for example, on this one, partial days in the start month divided by days in the start month. So, for example, in January, right? How much? Uh, how many days are there in thirty-one? Uh, right. This is the fourteen whole months over there, and finally, in the month of April, this is there, and first fifteen days of the April is not counted. Okay. okay. And this, based on this. Math, this formula, this is the multiplier coming up. Again, this day one, this is a pretty standard one. Okay, like if you go with the day, everything, uh, as I mentioned, right, everything was in term unit month. Month only, you would see all the precision. If it's in days, then nothing is there. Only with day it would come. And if you kind of think right, uh, logically as well, one with days, right, how the precision in the month it won't make sense. Okay, so logically they don't group together. For example, if you see this day, right? What does this precision method tell you? That okay, days divided by number of days necessary to complete the DST from the start date. So again, uh, this is considering whatever the year's transition is there. So this should be 366 considering I think this was the leap year. That's why. And this from this day to this day, it spans up to 462 days. So this is the precision. So if you see from all this one, right? I think this one is having the more precise value, right? And if you come with the day term unit, again the precision will be more. So that's why they didn't take month term unit for the with the day precision. The final one, the day with the calendar month weighted. It's again this one years plus remaining days divided by the sixty-six of the remaining into twenty-nine the other way sixty-five. So it's this is almost one year. This is the remaining from Jan tenth, twenty twenty to Jan nine, twenty twenty one. It would be one year. Okay, plus from Jan nine to this much date would be spanning about ninety six days. And this is X is it's the remaining days. This is twenty twenty one, so that is not a leap year. So that's why X gets plus three sixty five. This is the precision level. Okay, so it's all. Uh, you don't need to uh, worry about these. Like how this is all done with the within the package. But you should be aware of that. Uh, what are the different configurations available for proration within the CPQ package? Okay, and what is the impact of these? Right within these proration uh, methods. Right, considering if you are opting for months term unit. Right, so you see the more the this is going, reducing the precision basically. 
and the more the most precise one is this one the date okay generally in my experience i would like to share that uh, where the term unit is month right either people go for easiness with this month okay or it's day and and otherwise they go with the day and day combination because that is the simple thing that okay this many days and what is the precision is nothing but the number of uh, the span of the term okay so that's a simple thing you don't need to worry about these things anyways uh, we don't have to worry as a user okay because this is what cpq has designed so we should be aware of this precision level i hope that makes sense so we will go with this default thing whatever it is there i won't change anything uh rest there are few things for example if you want to ignore the leap days then you can ignore that is there so, uh one thing interesting thing i want to share about this is evergreen subscription so some things over here are really advanced okay. i just to think from a um, the product perspective okay i don't go into much how the technical uh, implementation would be there and all okay just understand the concept that okay what does this mean okay? um, and we'll focus on the main part whatever is there out of the boxes enable evergreen subscriptions enable evergreen subscription like right? evergreen subscription is nothing but in which a contract right doesn't have an end date it's as simple as that okay a contract which doesn't have an end date okay and can be cancelled any time that is basically an evergreen point and that is what the evergreen uh, concept is all about okay evergreening a lot of in finance um, it's more of a finance uh, concept so this is the thing that you can enable this in a uh, evergreen subscription within there and i'll show you when uh, the products will go to right there is a renewal method basically that would come up that uh, if we enable this there are few more options getting handed to us okay but just for now think that evergreen subscription is nothing but a contract which doesn't have an end date which doesn't expire but can be cancelled at any time okay then again um, we evaluate bundle logic on re, uh, renewals basically when we are doing re, uh, renewal then we have the original contract with some bundle so in case we have changed the bundle configuration within that renewal period then just to evaluate that okay some uh, for example bypass preserve bundle structure this is so when we have there is a concept like in, within the configuration product configuration like right? bundling okay for example i was mentioning some products which are sold together generally sold together so some, some of the companies they uh, configure the product catalog in such a way that okay these products generally go in hand in hand okay so this is about that only that okay once we are quoting that uh, using that products in the quotes right you want to bypass so that people can play around uh, have the flexibility or if whatever the product group has designed the product catalog we need to uh, adhere to that one, okay this is structure uh, this setting is all about that quotes if you coming to the quotes one disable initial quote sync so generally in the cpg concept i will show you also that once we uh, add a quote right the quote lines basically get synced with the opportunity line itself because once we create an opportunity right then we create a quote so that in syncing if you want to turn it off then you can turn it off with this one uh, default quote validity generally the quotes right which are created have a validity of 30 days after 30 days you can the quote would be expired so that again depend upon company policy how they are being designed order again orders when we convert the quotes into orders right whether that would be so you want the process to be like the quote should be approved and reviewed by some in the senior management then only it should be converted to order so then you can uh, enable this approved quote over here you can enable allow multiple orders like for example uh, some quotes for example uh, i have added 10 items in the quote right? i want to order five right now but two months after i want to order the rest of the other one so you can enable the allow multiple over there orders over there or the start date what is the order start date so either it can be the today or i think it can be the start date quote start date so that is the finally addition settings there are further things there are little bit of technical for example triggers this managed package cpq has their own triggers and things like that so you can disable over there okay the quantity scale this is again this should be in line with the unit pricing scale right which we were seeing in that uh, pricing also that there so these are about view how you want to see the bundle views in the wizard tab okay something like that and uh, yeah i think these are the standard things over here 
enable large configurations. I think if you do, they also have, if you want to have a code around 400 or 500 is a limit, then uh, you can enable that one product option. Call. Then again, something I would show you once we are into the course and so that, that would make more sense. Otherwise, I keep on blabbering and go away from something. Okay. I think this was the high level uh, configuration, this one, okay. CPU configuration. Now, tell me one thing, as we installed this package, right? So there are certain components which came in, in CPU. Okay. As for example, we saw the document thing, right? there were some folders created. So similarly to that, there would be some other uh, components also created with this package. Okay. Now, can anyone tell me how I would identify that this is a package component or if it's a standard form? Within this install package, right, we have something called as namespace prefix, right? This is what tells you that, okay, this is a package component. Now, and this is what um, helps you to segregate between different components. For example, if you remember in standard sales cloud, there's a code, right? There's a contract object. And within the CPQ also, there's a code object. There's a contract. How would one differentiate that this is what, because I would be thinking that, okay, I'm adding things in the code, then, but it's not performing how the product is designed. Okay, this is not going well. How I would differentiate between these two? This thing would come in and do with it. Namespace prefix. And if you want to see and show you the object manager, you have code, which is code prefix. Right? And I think so, uh, this one, API name. All this one, SDQQ, whatever it is. Right? So that means by default, it is a CPU. When you install a CPU package, it would come with this one. This means uh, this name space. Everything is not about object objects, it's none of the components, it's not just company table, settings, whatever it is. Right? Everything is now. So uh, for all this one, right, uh, we have different modules over here, like uh, products and bundle uh, happens to be one of them. Again, there is a pricing, there's a quoting, and within all these, right, there are further topics. Okay. So for each topic, right, how I would do is I would maybe explain you the concept. Okay, that okay, how things are there. And then I have some hands-on uh, guide as well, okay, which is very, very, very comprehensive step step guides. Okay, you can consider them. So we'll go through all of this in the class itself, right? That okay, uh, for example, so that you get the because CPQ from my personal experience, you one won't understand or it is not theoretical until and unless you go and try out these things and play around yourself. Then only this thing. And once these concepts are fit in, believe me, any product you can play. So this additional setting, I, I think a um, lot of things might have went over the head, okay? Because you might have not seen actual products. But as we go through these each concept, right? Maybe whatever the relevant settings are there, I can uh, help you to relate it so that you are aware of that, okay, when uh, that setting kicks in, okay, and when not, okay, and that would have an influence on these, okay? So all the concepts, right? Even a small, small things as well. So this would be covered with this exercise, then, okay? And we'll everything will perform it on the class itself. I will first walk you through the concept and how things are there. Okay, what is this? Explain you, and then once we are comfortable with that, we'll do a uh, exercise on this one. Okay, all together in this one. Okay, so I'll just briefly touch base on different types of products in general. The different cat, uh, product categories which are available. Okay. And then we'll see into Salesforce tomorrow that how and what are the things. There. So if I have to categorize by right, products, so I would broadly categorize the products into let's say four categories. Okay. First one, it's a non-subscription product, or I would say a perpetual product. This is nothing but a one-time product or a standard product, like some kind of an asset. For example, laptop, camera. Okay. The, so these these are the things, or, or I, I can say it more of a tangible assets, right? These are like nothing but a non subscription product because you buy it one time, you don't subscribe or don't pay for each and every after some time period for these products, right? That is one thing. Next comes the subscription product, suppose that thing. Then we have some kind of a subscription to that product. You don't own that product, for example, Netflix subscription, we have the data plan. Okay, these are all we are subscribing to some of the other kind of subscriptions. Now, again, it depends what kind of subscription you have, but that's a separate thing. But 
this is what the successful product would be. Third comes, which is very, uh, I would say, very in nowadays, and a lot of companies are following that one. It's called something called as usage based products, right? And these are very, um, the reason being because the companies are also doing and the customers are also liking this because of the value for the money for these types of products. This would be, for example, a data plan for your mobile or your broadband, right? What these companies, what telecom companies they offer, right? Let's say up to 2 GB, you are free to browse. But post 2 GB, we would be uh, charging you 10 cents per, per gig or whatever the unit of measurement they have, right? So something like that. So pay as you go model kind of thing. Right? How much if I have used 5 GB, I have used that much. So up to 2 GB, 3 GB, from 3 GB, I would have different slabs which, which I would agree with the company previously. And I have to pay for that. So that is the usage based model. Okay. And finally, uh, in CPQ world, there is something called as multi dimensional MDQ product. Okay. Multi dimensional coating product. What does that mean? Just a quick info, guys. Intellipad provides Salesforce online training mentored by industry experts. The course link is given in the description below. Now, let's continue with the session. This would generally kick in uh, when the product we have, right, which would be divided into certain segments. Okay, and these segments, right, single product, which is divided into different segments, these segments can be quarterly, monthly, yearly, whatever it is. Okay, how this is designed is thinking, uh, let's say I have uh, purchased an Office subscription, okay, Microsoft MS Office subscription. Uh, for the first year, I didn't had maybe that much of employees within my firm, right? So I think about 50, 50 subscriptions. For the year two, there was a surge that, okay, I had to, like, I know that, okay, based on my forecasting or whatever it is, something, some reason, okay, I had purchased more, more of those products. Year three, again, uh, maybe it was a temporary uh, surge. I had to get down to that. So it's a multi-dimensional coating. It's the same product with an but having a different charges in different segments. For year one, I can do this one, year two, I can do this one. Okay. Or you can think like sometimes if you have some kind of a multi-year deal, right, with some firms, right? What they do is like, okay, you get this one for the year one, get 50% off, we will give you, but for the year two and three, four, there would be some kind of a clause to it. Okay. So this is one another kind of a product category, okay. MDQ product. Okay. I hope is this. Um, are these four categories clear? Yeah. So uh, again, yeah. So within this CPQ products, like primarily our focus would be more on the perpetual, uh, non um, uh, non subscription products as well as the subscription products. Okay, how these products we are configuring, how these once they are configured, how they are putting into the quotes. Okay, how once these products are into the quotes, how we confirm the order. How we again contract those. Okay, again, we all would some things depending on how the CPQ package is configured. Okay, uh, based on that contract, we create some subscriptions, like okay, for the subscription products. Okay, once the subscription are close to end, then we do a renewal so that we start the cycle again. It is again the CPQ life cycle, uh, which I was showing you. Okay, okay. non subscription products, these are the ones. Uh, which, which which we just discussed. These are like kind of an assets over here, and generally these are converted into assets once they are contracted upon subscription products. I was mentioning about subscription products. Cool. Um, before actually we went to the next slide, I want to showcase how these looks like within Salesforce. I hope you are able to see my Salesforce screen. So I am into my products object. Okay. Before actually I start over here, we are using the standard Salesforce product object. There is nothing like I explained you about that SPQQ namespace yesterday, right? For the CPQ, when we install CPQ, certain objects, certain fields, they are getting installed. So this is nothing but standard Salesforce object. There is nothing uh, Salesforce or uh, CPQ specific within this. Okay. Now uh, coming to products. Now, I was, as I was mentioning about the subscription products as well as uh, the non-subscription products, right? Given two product records, right? What is an identifier? Like, uh, if you say that, okay, say that, just tell me what is an identifier between two products? How would I know that this is a subscription product or this is a perpetual product? So, over here, there are certain attributes of products which helps us to 
uh, understand that this is a subscription product or this is a non subscription product okay. for subscription product there are three key fields which uh, helps us to identify that this is a subscription product i think yes let me just open one of the subscription products as well maybe we'll just compare both of them so this is just a doorbell camera okay uh, definitely this is an asset right you're not you're not subscribed to camera okay so this product has been configured okay again this is not a subscription product how we are defining that one there is three key fields over here one is the subscription pricing second is the subscription term and third there is a subscription type field okay what does these fields are okay subscription pricing over here right I, i'll just uh, object manager also open it and this was a uh, stat uh, perpetual product now coming to a subscription product right how does a subscription product look what is the difference between this this is a home security monitoring right you won't be able to have an asset for this kind of a product rather you would subscribe to the recordings of those cameras right to the cameras or maybe security monitor so this is a subscription kind of thing so how in 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 this product right if you see the three fields i mentioned about the subscription pricing it is a fixed price okay subscription term it's mentioned about 12 and the subscription type over here it's renewable as i mentioned right the subscription products only can be renewed non subscription it doesn't make sense you would renew it okay i hope everyone is okay with this okay perfect so now this subscription price right what kind of an object or what kind of a attribute this is okay this is a pick list field okay i would show you when i edit this which is consisting of two options either it can be a fixed price okay or it can be a percentage of total a uh, percentage of total is that this basically this product doesn't have any price of its own but it would depend when it this, this kind of a product is added right it would depend on the line items we have quoted together for example just to give an example definitely we'll see an example going forward but suppose monitoring security monitoring is there right it would be some percentage let's say if a camera is costing 100 dollars okay this would be a 10% of that something like that combination okay these types of uh, pricing is there right the percentage they don't have any price of its own it would be very dynamic depending upon what other line items we have added as part of it. okay and fixed price is nothing but a standard uh, price for entry now next one subscription term this is a number field over here now over here we have mentioned 12 right you remember yesterday i was mentioning you about that this 12 what does this 12 mean is it 12 days 12 months 12 years how is it how we would know because if this attribute doesn't tell me anything whether it's months what is the unit of means that okay it's 12 months for now if i change over there then it would become 12 days and finally there's another pick list called subscription type which consists of two values renewable and one time okay so as i mentioned the subscription products right they can be renewed okay so most of the cases this is renewable in this so that's how you differentiate between a non subscription product and a subscription product okay so can tell me what are the three fields over here but remember these are the three fields which would help you to segregate that okay what uh, what is the difference uh, or how would you segregate uh, differentiate between a subscription and as well as a non subscription product okay now um, a little bit of standard admin concept i just a refresher i hope you guys know it but suppose as i was mentioning right this fixed price or this prices are configured where are those prices configured right for a product so there is a price book um, separate object in which we maintain the prices it's a by default there is a standard price books when uh, it is when you install a simple uh, developer edition you get this even in the sales uh, cpq also okay, you have a standard price book which is giving you the list price over here okay? you can have defined multiple price books okay um, generally people uh, in their implementations they go by uh, different price books like in different currencies like for example european market they would have these products costing this much in euros probably whereas in um, us market right these same prices would be configured in usds with having this price 
So you can have multiple price books as well. So, and from here, you uh, fetch the pricing for a given product, okay, whether it's a subscription product or whether it's a uh, perpetual product. Both of them should have a price. Make sense? Okay. Now, um, tell me one thing. If suppose I have to check the relationships between different objects, do Salesforce provide any kind of a, I would say, tool to check the schema? Okay, this object is how related to this object. So if um, somebody has to check that, okay, how the product object has been related to the price book, then there is a junction object called price book entry. Okay. All those things can be visualized within the schema builder. Okay. That's uh, the easy way to figure that out. Okay. So now we are aware of this, how the products and subscription and the perpetual products look. We'll go through certain more attributes which are available uh, only when the CPQ package is in, in, um, installed. Okay. For example, one of them uh, is this quantity. If you see over here, yeah quantity control section under this quantity control section you would find there's a checkbox called quantity editable and there's a default quantity what does this mean is when you add this product to a particular code right by default this would be added with one quantity and the quantity you can edit it. Okay. let's just quickly see how is the behavior for this one looks like for example let me just open this code We'll navigate, I, I, I will show you the navigation steps also, how from starting, I was mentioning about the life cycle, right? That also will pop through. Uh, but just to show you certain attributes behavior, would be helpful. Let me just clear this, save it, and let me just add door bell camera. So I added this product. Now I, I was mentioning on this one, what is there? By default, the quantity is one and the checkbox is checked. So when I add this line item to code, right, by default, the quantity came as one and I have the option. I, you see this pencil icon. If you click on this, you can edit this uh, quantity as well. You can edit it, just quick save it, quantities too. Now, suppose I edit this and let me just uncheck this quantity editable format, okay? Over here, now how the behavior would look like, I'll need to add this product again. Otherwise, it won't reflect the updated uh, setting. So now this product, I have added it again. You remember I added it too. Now this one, you see, got added as one, but now there's a lock icon, right? Now you can't edit these quantities. So certain, um, this one would come handy when, uh, suppose, in which we have a fixed asset availability or which we have a fixed availability, right? So that we don't uh, over uh, overcode these kind of products. So that kind, we can use these kind of an attributes. Okay? So that was one quantity editable. Okay, and if you see over here, right, on these quotes, we have something called an additional discount, right? You see this pencil icon? Okay, so you see this additional discount column over here, right? If you click on this pencil icon, there's a uh, out of the box, the feature of discounting, you can put in a percentage discount or you can put in an amount-based discount as well. Okay, So this is also controlled by one of the attributes that, okay, for a particular product, you can give some discount or no, just to put in governance over how these products are used by the sales, right? So there is a field called non-discountable. Okay, So this um, and all the CPQ fields, right? One good thing is they have this info bubble Right, which would give you a quick overview that how this product would behave. Some are very, very descriptive. And if you are aware of it and sometimes so hovering over this would give you this uh, kind of a description. Okay. So let's just quickly see on this one also. For example, if I make this as non-discountable, okay, how this behaves. Let me have to add this again. So camera. So this won't affect the previous ones like uh, uh, we just mentioned, right? So over here, I have the quantity fixed because I have marked it non-editable. And now over when I hover on this additional discount, it is also locked, right? Because of this attribute configuration, non-discountable. Make sense? That's it. Okay, thank you. Um, let's just move forward. Okay, let me go back to my PPT and we'll touch base on all the other attributes. There are so many attributes. Sometimes even I also forget after so many years of working. <laughs> we are back on our uh, slides so we touched based on this how this subscription products look like quantity editable non-discountable we saw that okay 
for the subscription products, three key attributes I mentioned, the subscription price, okay, subscription term and subscription type. So any product which is having this three attributes configured, that means you can say that is a subscription product. Okay? That's how the system understands that, okay. Next, coming on to this concept, I think we touched base on this about the proration, but this slide is showing you about a, how this is looking. Like. For example, I have a product called MS Office 365. Product subscription term is configured as one month and on the price book, I've given as $10, right? For one month, this costing you $10. Similarly, I have another subscription uh, product called Cloud Storage. I have configured this as for 12 months, it would be costing $20. Now, suppose these products, right, are used within a code which is having a subscription of 12 months. Okay. How this would be different? When I add MS Office 365, right, 12 months, right? So what would be costing cost for this one? Like for one month, I have $10, right? My subscription is for 12 months. So 10, 10, 10, 10 dollars each month up to 12, which is making 120, correct? And cloud storage, I have configured it as for 12 months, $20 only, right? So for all this 12 months, it would be a standard flat price of $20. Makes sense? This is basically just to show you how the proration works within the CPK. Okay? And this is what again, for if you say six months, okay, then it would be uh, like this. It would be $60 because I have configured for one month. $60 and this would be half because 12 months I've configured uh, for $20 so half, half year it would be $10. This is again the proration multiplier okay and how this is dependent on is dependent on these two fees. So that is very very crucial yesterday also as mentioned so before any CPQ implementation we should be in agreement with our customers that okay what would be the term unit look like and what would be the prorate for fee because once this is configured this is the whole uh, I would say your foundation, all the pricing logics would be based on this. Later point of time, if we make any changes, it would screw up the whole implementation. So we should be absolutely clear okay, on these parts. Okay, moving forward. So this, this is basically uh, telling about those three fields only, how your uh, subscription, what are the three attributes, the subscription price, terms, okay, and the type renewable. Now, uh, the percentage of total subscription product. I was mentioning it about, right? Um, for the subscription price, we have two options as part of that pick list. One is the fixed price, and the second one is the percent of total subscription product. What does this mean? Let's say I have, uh, for example, I have a product called loss and damage warranty. Okay, Loss and damage warranty, right? Warranty for what kind of product it is giving, right? Maybe there would be some category of the products, right? It can be multiple products also. It can be one product also. I don't have any kind of a, a price defined for this. Okay? But how many products you would add? I would calculate the price for this particular LDW product, right? As 5% of that, okay? So again, this is a subscription product, which you can see from the screen because these attributes are populated, okay? Now over here, the difference is the percentage of total. The subscription price is percentage of total, okay? And what it is showing, what percentage? 5% of what type of product? Give me some category of the product, right? It's showing hardware products. Like all the quotes in, in the quote line, right? If you have added five hardware products, right? Whatever the five hardware products is costing together, I would say 5% of that would be my warranty cost. Is that clear? And there's an example over here in the next slide, you can see. So for example, I have added, suppose this Thunderbolt display, okay, and laser jet is my hardware product, okay? I have, and these are these are not my hardware products configured, the Apple Magic Mouse and this letter, that letter, whatever it is. Now, I've added this loss and damage warranty, okay? How it would calculate is, it would add these two, okay, 1,000 and 275, 1,275, and do a 5% of it because we have configured the system to have the price of this LDW product as 5% of all the hardware product, okay? This is a hardware product, this is a hardware product, and summing up these two, 5% is this 63.75. Make sense? We'll see a quick, uh, I'll show you how in Salesforce also. This looks like, let me just open it. Let's go to loss and damage product, okay? And I have to select one type of a product, which is having the percentage of total category as hardware, okay? 
So let me see if it's a hardware product. So I would configure this, let's say uh, this to be a hardware product. Okay. For example, this maintenance kit. Save it. Now, when I go, I add this maintenance kit over here. It gave me $50. Right. Now, let me add this loss and damage warranty. Put a missing this is that uh, okay, 10% of this one. Subscription price should be ideally five, five. Uh, for this configuration, it comes five percentage. This is a hardware category product. Okay, so it's uh, engineering family checking. Let's do this one. Yes, this is a hardware family product. Let's try this. Maybe. So this one, it's coming up to 27.50. How it is? Because my laser product, right, over here, it is configured to be having 275 list price, okay? And my loss and damage product, right, what I've asked him to do is 10% of all these products. 10% so of 275 would be 27.5, okay? Is this clear? Okay, um, I'll move forward. Now we have covered the subscription products, non-subscription products, certain attributes, how it looks like, how the behavior, we've covered how the price, percentage of total field and the fixed pricing works. Now I'll move to the next type of product, which is called a bundle product, okay? Which is very, uh, very important and very, and th this is what basically the, where the CPT kicks in, okay, the added benefit from this. Now bundle products are nothing, as I mentioned, right, the, if you want to sell a group of products together, okay, then you can create a bundle and you can sell it. Okay. Makes sense. Okay. I have, uh, when you would see your org as well, right, you would see a bunch of um, products which are having a bundle. Okay. But when do we say or how do I identify, again, my same question, that this product is a bundle product. I can't, any of these attributes can't tell me that it's a bundle product. Okay. There is a separate object called product options, right? Which is a related again to product, which is over here, right? As you keep on adding products, right? Over here, this would make your bundle. Okay. This is a product option. Uh, this is a, this object is called product options. Okay. So for example, this laser printer over here, right? I have seven options within fitted within this. Okay, I have a toner, tray, a high capacity tray, letter, maintenance kit, and all those things, right? Now, if I add this product, right, let's maybe see over here, but let's just again uh, go back to four months and see how these products are, how this, when this is a bundle product, right, how these products get looked in within the code. Let me just go to code again, click on edit line. Okay. By the way, this when you click on this edit lines, right? This screen which comes up, we call it as QLE screen, port line editor screen. Okay, this is a CPQ package screen only. Maybe it's a page or something like that. Okay, so once I try to add a product, let's say a bundle product, laser printer over here, select. When I, somebody selects this product, this automatically takes me to a page in which it would give me, okay, uh, what are the other options within this uh, printer? We have a toner, we have a tray, high capacity tray, letter, and all those kind of things, right? So this is how the behavior looks like on a code when we add a typical bundle product, okay? Now, uh, let's just try to create and show you, walk you through the steps that how we can create a bundle product. Let's just try to create a new product over here. Let's just name our product maybe uh, basic okay. something for our family and give it as hardware to make this interactive. Let's just keep this as blank for now. This would be uh, this. I don't need the subscription products to this. Okay, okay, okay. No, no, the green, the key, and just save this. Okay, so this is my simple product creation. Okay, so now I can't say this is a bundle product. 
Now, suppose within this desktop basic product, right? Um, I need to add some more products within this, right? For example, CPU, RAM, and how, how I would add this. I would go to this option over here, or you can, um, this is a related quick links. This is the latest, not latest, I would say. A couple of releases back, they have introduced the quick links in which generally um, if the pages are huge, right? A lot of scrolling up and down. So they have made it a quick thing so that people don't have to scroll up and down, right? Or one another way is you can go to related, okay? There is a related section of options, okay? This is, you can go over here, click new, okay? This is a new product option, right? All the options you think, right, which is, uh, should be part of this bundle, right? Extra basic package, right? That should you keep on adding as part of it. Let's add one product over here. This is a number field. Again, if you hover on this, it shows you sets the display order of this option within the feature it's assigned to, okay? Let's park the feature for just now, okay? It's just an ordering um, thing. This, this attribute, right, basically, Starts from one, one, if you are putting a lower number, then it would remain at the top. And as you keep on increasing, it would go to the bottom. Okay. So general best practice, it says you start with 10, 10, 20, 30, this naming convention you can follow. Okay. But there's no hard and fast tool you follow. The reason being, um, so some products are very configurable, right? But for example, if I put in one to this, right? And tomorrow there comes a product which needs to be added as part of this bundle. And I want to reflect that as in the top, right? Then I don't have any option, right? So that's why uh, most cases people try to start with 10 so that tomorrow, if anything comes up, right? I can put nine, eight, seven, so that it reflects in the top, okay? Configured SKU, okay? SKU stands for stop uh, in this typical sales terminology, stop keeping unit. Like it shows you that this option is part, is configured, as part of what parent product, right? So that this attribute shows you um, the parent product. Like for example, we click from the desktop basic, then we click on new, it automatically populated this one. And our optional package, I have a lot of products. Let's say maybe CPU something is there, right? CPU, okay. So I've add one CPU. Um, selected and required, these two fields. What does this signify is when you add this product, right? It is automatically selected. You don't need to go and select this uh, option over here. So this option would uh, be, if you set this flag, right? Selected, this would be like Required is that when you sell the desktop basic, it is mandatory you sell this as well. Okay, so this would be required over here. You'll see bunch of configuration. Okay, as part of this desktop package, how many CPU, uh, this CPU i7 processor, how many of them uh, you want to add? It could be quantity over here. You can mention is it editable? Somebody can configure this. Yes, it can be editable. Or if you have a predefined bundle, okay, so you, you don't want anyone or the sales to disturb that uh, bundle, then you can mark it as not uh, quantity not editable. Is there any minimum quantity you need to sell? that you can configure okay if you don't okay that's fine minimum maximum everything this is an interesting thing what type of product option i'll come to this in a minute okay there are three this is again a pick list value there are three um, types of product options component accessories and related products they have different behaviors which i'll just come to in a minute okay uh, again this bundled what this this uh, flag means right this this is a bundled uh, option like for example, this is means that this price for uh, this would be a zero price on the code line. Okay, the price for this product or this option, right, is already factored while designing the price of the parent product, right? Otherwise, it can have its own price as well. If I don't check this, we'll see this feature as well. Okay, um, so these are the basic thing. If you want to add some discount, unit prices, and all, okay, let's just save this now. There is one. CPU. Let me just add one more over here. For example, 20. Um, let me see. Me run here. And there. Let me just not select this. Okay. Uh, and one, two, three, six, this as well. Let me just add one more. Um, three, six, and five hundred. This one. This is also 
the let me just make this as required. So these are the three options I have configured. Now I'll show you one thing. Let's see how this product looks like. Okay. This is not coming. I can think of one reason why it is not coming is that this product, right, which I've configured, I have not added any price book entry. And if there is no price book entry, okay, this product won't reflect on the portal. So let's just go ahead and add a price book entry. At standard price, let's say $2 and okay. So as soon as I added the price book for my product, which I created, desktop basic, it started reflecting. Right? So that is a one key takeaway that all the products which we are configuring within the system, it should always have a price book entry to that. Otherwise, you won't be able to find it on the price selection screen, product selection screen. When I added this, it came like this, already was added with this. Now, uh, let me just click on this wrench icon. Okay. If you remember, when we were configuring the products, I've did some permutation combination for different things. Okay, for CPU, I added it as selected. Okay, so which is already selected, which means this for the hard drive, I marked as required. Okay, just a quick info, guys. Intellipad provides Salesforce online training mentored by industry experts. The course link is given in the description below. Now, let's continue with the session. So, it's already required, and there is no option to deselect it because it's a mandatory product. And for this one, I didn't select it anything. So you can see it's kind of an, or you can think of an optional product right within the bundle. All those optional products can be configured this way that, okay, uh, based on the demand from the customer, you can select or deselect. Okay, makes sense. Okay, uh, let's just do one more thing. I was, so this is how the bundle products looks like. Okay, I have one contact. Okay, over here already, Jack. Rogers, okay. and you can like I believe it's a simple administrative stuff. You can create a contact as well. Okay, so generally you can use this one or create a new contact as well. Okay. I won't go into that. Then once we have a account, basically the company details within this company details who is our contact that is also we know. Okay, then the next step would be like a creation of opportunity. Let's go ahead and create one opportunity for. So let's say um, I need some home appliances and opportunity input. Close date, something in future, staging, we are in prospecting stage. Okay, so we're here. I created one opportunity over here, home appliances. So this is my opportunity creation. So this is where uh, I would say the lead conversion happens and we create an in quotes in quotes. Now this customer, right, Burlington Textiles, right, they might have some demand of home appliances from our firm who are dealing with this, right? They are interested in this. So we are in a prospecting stage at this point of time. So what I will do is I know that the customer is demanding these things. Like, let me just go and create a code out of it. Okay? So I have one way to create this code, new code button, okay, which is again out of the box. Nothing has been done you would see in your auth as well, or you can go ahead and uh, click new code from the related code section as well, okay? I'll go ahead and create a code, okay? So um, over here, right, I just want to say about this primary flag. Okay, this is crucial. There are a lot of um, activities, okay? I won't set out all the ones in one go, but you consider that for an opportunity, right? For example, this, uh, Home appliance demo. Is it, it? It is not necessary that within one shot my code is approved and uh, customer agrees to it, right? There would be a lot of to and fro's between the customers and myself, right? My sales team. That okay, uh, let's change this one. Some some error happened. Some data is incorrect. Whatever it is, but it is a highly possibility that I can have multiple codes. But remember, there would be only one final code which we, that would be converted to an order, right? And for conversion to order also, uh, within the CPQ, there is a validation that, okay, the order must be primary before you actually convert the code into an order. Okay. So that's why uh, 
generally uh, you can when you start with the first one you can select uh, this primary thing and uh, else you can always go ahead and create new one and it's automatically unchecked the previous primary okay so it's an out of the box functionality now this is there what is my start date let's say um they want from 21st okay subscription term let's say 12 months i won't put end date it's uh, like it's kind of an option, honestly. Okay, if you're putting a subscription term, CPQ would already calculate that you're giving a start date. There's a 12 months uh, subscription term, it would be end date, would obviously be whatever, uh, 20th Feb, maybe 2023, that would be end date. Or either ways, you can put an end date over here, don't put in subscription term. Okay, that won't cause any harm. So, with this, I created my code. Let's just code my code. Okay, within this code, right? With, if you follow this flow, right, a lot of codes data would be pre-populated for you. For example, um, this opportunity, I have used this opportunity. This opportunity is related to what account that is coming up over here. Okay, A primary contact, I think um, it's not there, but we can put it over here. Uh, anything, what was there, we can have a, a logic field that it can suck in the primary contact for that account. And what was there, we can um use that yep next thing by default code has different state statuses okay again this is a i would say standard with the cpq fields okay which you can see in the object manager dra uh, draft approved ordered something you can this out of the box or you can customize it again as per your coding process of the company expires on okay that's an interesting one it says me 3 12 2022 like 12th of March, 2022, okay? It populated automatically. So I was saying that expiry date, right? It's 30 days, basically. This is coming to be 30 days. The day is code is created. So created by is equals 10th, right? It's 30 days. How come it is 30 days? Okay, that I was showing you. In the install packages, right? We have a setting on the code tab in which we can configure that, okay, what would be my quotes uh, validity, default quote validity over here, right? 30 days. So based on this, this is calculating 30 days. And I will I also show that on the quote, this expires on, it's a date field, which is having this default value set based on the package setting, this one. That in the package, if you have this SPQQ default validity, not blank, then you can set this value to be today plus that whatever the number I have configured over there. Okay. So that's why it is coming 30. Okay. We can configure it again if you want 60 days validity by default. Okay. Or not. Then we can configure all this. Okay. There are other fields on this one. I won't cover pricing fields and all. Okay. Address information. Yep. So this is again out of the box capability. You have build to addresses and ship to addresses. Okay. Honestly, it depends like how, how the business of your customer is. That there are sometimes cases that uh, the customers we are shipping to is the same as shipping and the billing address is same. If it's a different one, definitely we should have some kind of a logic or segregation that, uh, or maybe some kind of a record type introduction within the accounts. Like this is my billing account and this is my shipping account. So that ways we can have that sorted in case that the address is different. Otherwise, out of the box, it's again, uh, when we use any account over here on the code, it fetches this account's details over here by default. Okay. So this is basically my code. Okay. Uh, I, I don't know. If I've I think I have not added any line items. Okay. So over here, um, a quick view. This is a field over uh, It shows that okay, in any um, how many line items you have added to this particular code, and this code is how long has been opened. Okay. So let's just quickly add. I would show you one uh, subscription, and let's say add a couple of more subscriptions. When we first time add any code, it would ask you to choose a price book. Okay. Since we have only one thing, let's just save it. And let's add some more description for camera or something. And this camera. So this code, right? My code which I've created. I've created one um, camera, which is again a perpetual product, not a subscription-based product. I've added again a Bell, doable camera, which is again an asset, not a subscription product. And this home security monitoring, which we saw, right? Uh, it is a subscription product, okay? So if I have added all the start dates in uh, subscription term, everything is there, right? Now, let me just 
save it. So assuming that okay, my customer and the sales rep both agree on this, okay, then um, we can go ahead and confirm this code, right? Basically, what code to by confirmation I mean that we can uh, create order out of it. Okay, hang on. Before this creation of order, right? I was also mentioning about the branding and documents, right? We also have out of the box, I think there should be one template available. Let's just see that. A code document creation, right? Uh, you can have standard content, okay? And some branding elements like the company logo or something you can add to it. I think there is only one, which we can just go ahead and use that and see. Even uh, this is basically a PDF document, which um, helps you to represent your sales data. Yes. There is one something like this kind of a document. I think this is totally customizable. For example, Salesforce, they have added their logo. This is a proposal code. I think this is the bill to address maybe. The dates, the code date. This is a code date. This is expiration on date. Okay. And uh, yes, there is one page which would depict my, uh, my the products which I've added. And I think there is already one logic over here about the one time in the subscription product, maybe based on the product category they are segregating already. So this is my one time product, for example, the digital camera, this is the price, what is the quantity, okay? And this is my doorbell camera, doorbell camera comes up with this hardware, uh, sorry, so this is a, these both two are hardware products, hardware subtotal is like this. And again, this is a uh, SD card we added as part of the digital camera. So this one is a miscellaneous type of product family. So this is $20 over on this much is this. The subscription product is costing $200. So like that we can have, and this code uh, document can consist of your company's DNCs okay, in different languages. I think this is how they have been added. Some kind of a signature mechanism at the end. So it looks more of a, a formal kind of a document, right? Instead the people or the companies earlier before I would say, I was mentioning about you about the document challenges, right? So people might add some language on their own or something like that. But now I have a standard content, which all the quotes, all the salespeople, they would be using. Okay. And all, and it's as, per, as per the company's policies, all the TNCs have been added over here. So this helps uh, you to design or address those challenges. Okay. And I think you can mention the paper size. Different countries, they have different uh, paper sizes also to be used. So they have considered this. And uh, you remember when we were seeing the CPQ package, I was mentioning about the languages also. There was a setting. Um, if you enable that setting, you can have this documents generated in different languages as well. Okay. So let's go ahead. Now this document is there. It's agreed. Everyone is okay. Let's go ahead and create an order out of it. Okay. The next step, how can do is there's a checkbox, okay, out of this uh, CPQ product they provide this checkbox, select this checkbox to automatically create an order from this code. If this is the primary code, it's mentioned over here that only a primary code, right, which is there, it can be only ordered. Okay, let me go ahead and uh, click order over here. So mm -hmm. I have one order record created over here. If you see in the related list, there is an order record created. So mostly in the order record, all the details which we have captured as part of the code, right? It gets copied. Okay, what are the account details, status, start date, whatever we have mentioned, everything. What is the code amount? Everything comes over here. Okay. Now um, there are two things on this one. So once this order is order is confirmed, basically means that okay, we both are agree, and uh, the company who is selling their services or goods, they they confirm that okay your order is now we need to contract this as well this order right that there should be a contract between uh, the customer and the companies how that is happening uh, again i'll just show you one more thing all the four products which we added as part of the code line right everything comes as part of the order products we don't have any contracts anything over here as of now the first and foremost thing before we actually order is there right still it is in draft status right once things still, uh, I would say, not finalized or is in kind of an end of uh, at the end of the tunnel before actually it starts, uh, it's finalized. There are two things over here. One is a contracted fee just to create a contract out of it okay? and contracting method. 
what is the contracting method over here? It's again a pick list, which is having two values. Okay. In cases where we have the subscription products added to the code, which would be having different dates. Like let's say if I'm doing it for 12 months right now, uh, maybe I don't need uh, some products I've added, just not immediately, maybe, but after six months like that. Okay. So this, these two configurations would help that how many contracts can be created. Okay. So let's go by the default one for now. Okay. And click on this contracted checkbox. Once I click on this contracted checkbox, there would be a contract object. Okay. Which would be created. Okay. Before actually we create an odd uh, contract, we need to activate this order. Uh, we think the final step, right, of creating order is like before actually we generate a contract. This is the final stage. We create and activate this order that, okay, this is done. And the activated date is captured by who activated it. That's also done. See, there should be a contract generated. Sometimes it takes some few seconds to generate these. Okay. Now, meanwhile, okay, I didn't see this. Sorry, I just activated it. Let me just contract it. Remember one thing, contract, if you put a contract, right? Contract would only be created for a subscription product because this contract, right? Again, later point of time, you would be uh, going back to the customer that, okay, you subscribe to our services, so and so, okay? So, but you are about to end your subscription. Do you want to renew it? Or maybe you want to make some changes to that one. So, in CPQ, the contract is created only and only for the subscription product. Then you would ask me that what would happen about the one-time products, what we have done, how we are, how I would know that, okay, this customer like for Linton Textile, they bought uh, two digital cameras also from me. How the system is not tracking this one, contract is not consisting of this. Then I would respond to you that, okay, Yes, the contract is only consisting of the subscription products, okay? But the non-subscription products are tracked as something called as asset, okay? When we contract an order, right, all those subscription products get added as part of the contract and all those non-subscription products, they get added as part of the assets, okay? Now, you see within this contract, right, again, all the things comes from the quotes to orders and orders to contracts. They get transferred. The account number, okay. The status is by default draft. Contract start date is nothing but the code start date we added over there. Okay. We added a contract month of 12 months. So it is calculating 12 months from the start date, which is ending on this 2023. Okay. Uh, what else we have the contracts? Uh, it is linked to the opportunity, which opportunity is there, which quote was converted, which order was converted. Okay the price book basically which was used while uh, contracting this opportunity that's also added over here i think yes these are the information which came by over here and now if you see this contract right as i mentioned in our code i added only one subscription product the home security monitoring that's why as part of this contract they created one item only as part of the subscription which is this home security monitoring which is the code line all this getting tracked that, okay, this is related to what contract type, start date, what is the price, um, uh, multipliers, quantities, everything is getting tracked over here. Okay. And how about this one? Uh, Non-subscription product. Okay. This I can see on account as well. If you go on this account, right, you see this account, right? I have one order, okay, which is just now we placed. Okay, one active contract over here one subscription and three assets you remember on our code line right there were four line items added so three were non-subscription products so that's why it is captured as assets okay and the subscription products they are captured as subscription so once this contract is created okay, it is activated so, uh, again after this one what is happening generally the I would say best case would be nothing. Customer uh, is not asking for anything. Okay. But as soon as this contract ends, right, maybe uh, we have some kind of a um, automation configured or designed within our system, which uh, highlights or which alerts or says, particularly says that who has contracted this uh, created or who is dealing with this particular account, right? That your customer's contract is coming to an end. 
better to check it and see if they want to renew it, something like that. Okay, so that is a renewal process from a contract. We'll not go on this session on this one, but again, that is there. Or if there is a, I would say, some customers come back, right, and they ask that within the contract, within this duration, right, they say that, okay, hey, uh, I opted only for one security monitoring product from you but I have a demand for three more. Can you please uh, amend a contract to add the additional three as well? Yes, we can do. We have an amendment functionality to this one, okay? So that would also basically amend this contract, add those additional um, products which they have added within this same contract, okay? So that's how the entire CPQ life cycle, which I was showing you, right? How from creation of the opportunity, quotes, orders, contracts, then we can do amendments or renewals. And again, renewals, if you're doing it, we'll again do it uh, with having a renewal opportunity. So um, yeah, again, it's the same cycle. Renewal opportunity, code, what are the products they have wanted and going to the circle continues. Okay. So now is it a bit clear that what this product does? That, that is all about how you design your uh, coding life cycle, right? That what are the different stages you want to see on your codes, okay? So um, then uh, the next type of product, right? Another type of product like subscription and this one is there, right? The next type is a product bundle, right? Bundle is nothing as the name suggests, right? The collection of the products offered together, right? The products which uh, generally are sold together, those are like bundle. Now um, it might vary. Some bundles are pre-configured, okay? So you need to sell them as is, okay? In some bundles, you can have it uh, some kind of a configuration as well. Okay. It can be, uh, we can call it as uh, customizable or configuration bundle. And third type of a bundle, I would say is a nested bundle, a bundle within a bundle. Okay. So just to uh, give you an example, right? Uh, what is a bundle? Like for example, a laptop is sold with a charger, hard drive, okay, processor. Okay. So th these are all individual items. Okay, which are sold together as part of a laptop bundle, right? Yeah. And what, why bundles, right? Generally, why the companies opt for bundle nowadays? Uh, why it is that? Because it helps you to facilitate some special pricing, right? For example, I gave an example about how um, when you buy a phone, right? And if I buy a phone, a charger comes free of cost in, in that box itself, right? Otherwise, you have to pay separately for it. Or maybe um, another example could be like if you're buying a TV, let's say HD TV 44, 43, 44 inches. And when you buy a PlayStation along it, you can get an offer of 30% off on that, right? So th the bundling helps to facilitate price, sell more, okay? So that's why it is more a preferred mechanism of selling nowadays, okay? Um, I think let's see over here what we have. This is the reason. Um, bundles, it's what it's a what I mentioned, a collection of products that are sold together. Okay, example, these are the bundles. And why this one? It's help you to enforce business logics like okay, the pro products which are generally required within a product, or maybe uh, you when you're selecting some products within this bundle, right? You can enforce um, rules such as that okay, minimum of this one uh, category of this CP, for example, should be there in a laptop. Okay, but um, for example. Uh, this one, a laptop bag can be an optional product. Okay, something something like that. Um, this is some example which they have given over here. Like for example, a MacBook Pro uh, in which you can have, well, it's a bundle product basically consisting of CPU, RAM and hard drive and similarly a professional pack, which is also consisting some of the products within it. Okay, uh, let's just show, uh, let me just show you in Salesforce. Let's just recapitulate again this one. So. We created one product, okay? For example, a desktop basic product, okay? And now uh, in order to make it as a bundle product, right? What we did is we introduced you to a special object called uh, options, okay? The API yeah. name of this is called product options. Generally, we call it as product options, okay? So as soon as within a product, right? In any product consists of an option, this product automatically will behave like a bundle product, okay? So for example, I, as part of this option, right, I added CPU, RAM and hard drive. Okay. And uh, now when, then I think show this. 
Uh, yeah, I remember one thing uh, more that um, when we added this product, it was not initially showing up on the code line screen. You remember then what we discussed that in order to display the products, so there was no price book. So if there is no price book, then the product won't be available uh, on the code line screen. Even if the product entry is zero, but there should be one price book entry. Okay, so uh, if we add this product, so you get this kind of a configuration screen that, okay, this product is fitted with what kind of an option. Okay, so this is um, a bundle. Okay, now let's just deep dive into this further. Like, um, for example, let's say, so it can be this way that, okay, I have added standard one CPU and one SSD. Okay, and also I think I have shown you about this selected and required also, right? In a given option, if it is selected by default, it is selected, then uh, already, let's just go to this product. This, this screen, by the way, guys, is called as product configuration screen. Okay, we're gonna see the screen a lot, okay? When I refer this product configuration screen, I would be referring this type of a screen, okay? So suppose this is a uh, this is my bundle, and within this three packages are there, the three products options are there. So one first one by default, why it is selected because I didn't do anything. It's just because I have marked this selected flag as true over here. Okay, that's the reason it's got selected. The second one RAM UGB, it's neither selected nor required. So that's why it's nothing is happening over here. And the third one, right, the hard drive, I've marked it as required. So this product is automatically selected and you can't uncheck it because it's a required thing, right? So this is to place some kind of a governance and we don't have a product mix mismatch okay, when we are quoting those things. So such kind of a governance, this things helps in such kind of governance, okay? Uh, quantity is similar over there. Next, um, number field. Okay, this is what I was mentioning about how the display order of these um, products. Okay, the like CPU is displayed over here first, RAM is second, and SSD 12, 512 is third, right? So let's say, um, let me, for example, add one more product to it, and I name it as 20, or maybe I have 20. Let me just name it as 11, okay? And I will add another category of product CPU. I think what I have added is i7. Let me add something more. i5, let me add it. Okay. I will just add it. Nothing. So I have added this. Okay. Though it's displaying over here as last, but when I go over here, right, and try to re add this product, or let me see, reconfigure it. Yes. So you see, right, I have added the number as 11. So first, it is getting displayed this one. Second is this one, third is this one, and fourth is this one. Okay, that's how it is being. That is the significance of this number. Now, okay, what we can do is now further to this, let's. This is a very, very, very basic, what is it called, a bundle. Okay, now this bundle is right. It's not sometimes very uh, like this, a small package, right? It is a huge catalog of things, if you see, right? For example, a laptop, right? For example, a desktop basic, which is the example which we are seeing over here. It can consist of, or it is a configurable desktop you can configure, right? I would have three, four variants of CPU, CPU three, four variants of RAMs, three, four variants of hard drive, okay? So now this, this view is fine, but we can enhance this view, right? There can be, it would be great that if I can have a logical separation between these three entities, like which are different, different, different entities, for example, one item is CPU item, right? In that uh, blog I go and I can choose that, okay, this CPU I want. Okay, now second one, I go in the RAM. Then these are three variants available uh, that works with this desktop that is there. And then uh, it can be similar for the hard drive, okay? So I would introduce you to a concept called as uh, features over here, okay? How this looks like. So. Um, I was mentioning you about another feature called as, but features, another feature called feature. What does this do is, like if I have to group my options, let's say if, for example, let me add a couple of this, I've added two CPUs, let me add one variant of RAM and one variant of um, this one. The one RAM each GB I've already added. Let me see, it's 16 gig. Okay. So now over here, if you go to this reconfigure screen, I have all my options, what I've added, okay. But it doesn't look good, right? It, 
it's it's not kind of a good ui or i would say these are not i have to go through or maybe if you see think of this a huge catalog right it's very hard to read hard to add things right? so it would be good if i can have that kind of a logical grouping right how those logical grouping happen on the product itself right like we went to options right there is another related list called features okay this is nothing but uh, just grouping of the options in which a bundle right has lot of options it's better that we have a grouping of the options so let's create a feature over here let's say one feature would be my cpus uh, i have another interesting thing like if i have some kind of a requirement that okay with any desktop which i'm selling out right should have at least one cpu then i can set this min option to be one okay so it what this means is like when this bundle is added to the code sales has to choose one option over here okay max is uh, if you want to say that okay this is the maximum limit if don't then okay there is nothing like that okay number again it's the same thing the order in which these features would be displayed okay so let's again uh, put 10 across this which is the configured skew it's for this bundle product desktop okay cpu one is there one feature let me put ram also that would be my second feature and third feature would be uh, my ssd now i have created this feature but i'm yet to group these options right like which which option is belonging to which feature i haven't done that configuration yet okay that i can i have i have to do by going again back to the options over here clicking in that click on this po numbers just a quick info guys intellipad provides salesforce online training mentored by industry experts the course link is given in the description below now let's continue with the session over here there is a field called features okay so you can say that okay this option i have added would come under this category uh, cpu category see now how it looks like so cpu all club together since i have added one minimum quantity is one right so it's showing me choose at least one one of the following similarly for the ram okay so now if suppose i try to save this one right you see for cpu i have already selected one for hard drive there is one required for ram there is nothing what if i try to save it would show me one validation that okay extra basic two few options selected in ram which means that i have to select at least one okay right comparatively to how it was looking earlier so this is the reason um, these choose at least one selection would come up and again there are options over here uh, at the feature level that you can select maximum if you put in that and again this 10 20 30 is the order in which this features would be displayed okay now this is one view okay let me just introduce you to one another field called as option layout okay so you see the screens over here right 1 2 3 there is this another pick list and cpq offers one another view of tabs okay if i select this okay, let's see how the behavior of this goes in see rather than sections i have in tabs over here the cpu is screen first in ram then up this is just the ui thing nothing same features just how the view is there okay and another value for this would be the wizard mode okay what does this look like same thing but we have this pagination over here that okay. okay first screen second screen and third screen like that you won't be able to go this way this this way okay so that's a that's a ui thing page option layout okay now another field i would like to show you is about this uh, option selection method okay this one i have bunch of so configured okay so over here right you see another section just uh, another attribute just below this this is an option selection method right basically how you want to select the option just see this this is again a pick list value and there are two values in this either it's a click or it's an add okay so when it's a click right you get this kind of a check boxes over there to select things okay this kind of a box but if you have an add right you won't have um, these options displayed right away like this you'll have to click a button and then you would be able to select okay the reason actually i, I have why i opened this particular example is because this one is there uh you do over here if i'm done one thing let me show you this fee 
field, right? The, uh, which is the option selection available. Oh, it's available both on the product level, basically the bundle level or the feature level as well. And whenever you have, whenever you have anything on the feature level, right? It would always overwrite whatever is there on the bundle level. Okay. So for example, see my 13 inch laptop over here. Okay. This 13 inch laptop, it has a section wise layout. Okay. And the option selection method is click. So, okay, fine. It's there click, you would say. Then how about this add-ons, right? What's there in this add-ons? This is a add-on. Now, this is my op uh, add option. The option selection mission is add. I'll show you where I have done this. So over here, you see features, right? There are four features, processor, memory, storage, and add-ons. So let's go into add-on. And add-on, right? Again, as I mentioned, right? This option is available on the product level, basically bundle, or the feature. Now, feature level, I have turned it to add. Again, same only. Click and add. Two options. And there is a dynamic also will, or dynamic bundle, but same options over here. Okay? So I've selected add over here. So how this UI looks like is this way. That, okay, these are options available in section-wise. Okay? And the add-ons, right, I have not displayed it like this. Rather, one has to click the option and select the add-ons. So this is uh, the difference between this one, these two attributes on the product option layout and as well as the option selection. Now, an interesting piece would be, since this is a pick list, right? So can there be two values selected of a pick list at a time? Now, suppose I get a requirement that, hey, would it be better that some things I get in a section view and some things in a tab view while con when this bundle is there, right? Would that be possible? Like if some 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 requirement, business requirement comes in, right? Hey, uh, can can I get a both best of the both worlds together, section and a tab view? So if this comes in, right, then the answer would be yes. And how? That's I'm gonna explain. At, at least you understood my requirement. That what. What is my ask? So getting a screen, a section and a tab view to in a single bundle, how is it possible? Then it is possible via a feature, okay, on the feature, feature object. What is that? It is called this one, category. If you see over and read this info bubble, right? Assign this feature to a category such that multiple features with related options are grouped together, okay? Uh, what would be the use case? A uh, standard use case would be like, for example, you can say that while configuring a bundle, right? Yeah, definitely I have CPU, RAM and all this. But these are essential things, right? It can, can I say that this is uh, like adding one, one abstract layer on top of it? Yes. That, okay, for a bundle, what are the essential things? I want to display that in one screen and the others are add-ons or whatever it is in the other, in other tab like that, right? If I have that kind of a use case, then let's say, I will, what I will do is add these, all the features which are essentials, considered as essentials, right? Uh, sorry, I have added one essential key over here. In your ops, you would see standard uh, hardware and software, okay? But it's nothing but it's a pick list value and we know how to add a value in a pick list, okay? So I won't go, but let me know in case you still want to see it, okay? So I'll configure this processor as an essential thing. Second, I'll say memory is also my essential thing. But my add-on, I would not say that is an essential thing. Okay, that's an added feature. So this three I have categorized essential. Now let's see if I go onto this code and yep, you see on there, it's section only. I haven't changed anything, but there are two tabs to that. So I have a tab view as well as a section view. Within this tab, I can say that all my essential processor memory and all, these are all essential items. Others, I have add-ons. Okay, you add it or not add it. It's a, optional thing. For laptop, what is an essential thing, non-essential thing, that is one level. Then further segregating, if you say further branching out the essential, that okay, what are the essential items, processors, memory, and storage. Further branching this processing processor, okay, which are the processors, CPU, uh, i7, i7, i7 uh, i3, and memory, further branching out that one, which memory gigs, okay, 8, 16, 28, whatever it is, right? Like that, you can see if you want to imagine as a tree structure. Right. So if you want to have both views uh, without changing this one, um, what do you say, this layout, that is possible. Okay, one more interesting thing I want to show you. Yeah. Over here, right, 
Now you see one difference that in processor, you get a radio button, whereas in memory, you get a checkbox. And the reason in can anybody guess? So in here, what I'm saying, memory, that okay, one option is minimum, fine. But there's no limit to max option. Okay. So that's why I can select multiple things. Whereas in my processor, I'm saying that, okay, one option is minimum but you can select at max one only. So that means ultimately you can select only one option. And in one option, it's better to have a radio button. So that's also one thing, like if we have some kind of requirement that where we want to select, enforce one kind of, uh, this kind of selection, then we can use this. And I think I also mentioned about the feature level uh, option selection method would override the parent bundle selection method, which we have seen that okay, over here it was click, whereas in the feature and add-on feature, I have added is add, right? So when I'm displaying add, this is getting a button rather than the click, okay? So let's go back to my cool. Okay, now on the product, okay, which we will see, Right now, what I was doing is that when I was adding a bundle product, I had to always go and click on that wrench icon, right? I was not automatically, when I add that product, getting that product configurator screen, right? I had to click one extra click, right? So that is also one, okay, that is also one way, okay? And the reason being why it was happening is because there are two fields on the product, which is a configuration event and a configuration type. So as of now, we didn't focus much on this. Okay, it was by default none. So that's why this is a default setting. If you click on this, select IT Pro Pack, then it would it automatically added. I used to click on this wrench icon and then this new kind of come, used to come. Okay. Now let's say I don't have um, this is not a good view. Like okay, when I want my sales rep and they were they're adding a product to a code line, they should first land into the product configurator screen instead of directly going to the code line view because they should be able to configure things, right? This is an extra screen for them. So in that case, we have a bunch of this. Uh, this is again, um, what do you say? Pick list, the configuration type is the pick list and event, it's a, I think it's the dependent pick list. Okay, I think, I hope you guys are aware of a dependent pick list, what it is. So on configuration type, there are three values, allowed, disabled, and one is required, okay? And under allowed, we have three events, edit, I think the edit, save, or an always something like that. Okay. And in required, it's always, always required is always with the event is always and um, type disabled is having always like that. So let's see the first option. If my configuration type is allowed and my configuration event is edit, right? Then what would happen if suppose my, uh, this one laptop, assuming my laptop is having this configuration and click on add products. Okay, IT Pro Pack or whatever my laptop, select this. It would directly land for me over here and I have to click on this wrench icon. Why? Because my configuration, I'm saying it's allowed, but event is edit. Edit means basically you have to go into the edit line, uh, edit line screen, edit line editor screen, and then click on this wrench icon. That's how it is a behavior to us. Okay, now always configuration event always, if I'm saying it's allowed again, always, then what is the behavior? Add, uh, add products pro pack selected, then it would directly land me to the configurator screen. It won't go to that edit line screen. Okay. Third, okay, they have come with this. Okay, now edit. Okay. Next one is a disabled one. Disabled as name suggests, right? You won't be having any kind of a configuration ability. So this one generally happens in case of the static or predefined bundle, right? I was mentioning. So in which companies they say that okay sales doesn't we won't don't want to say to touch our products whatever we have configured they just have to sell that as it is in this way uh, you can say always that it is disabled okay, you won't see that if you add this there is no wrench icon to reconfigure things so you have to use it as it is disabled is this yeah there is one another event uh, allowed goes with three options okay again I'll repeat myself edit always and add we have seen edit that we have added the product, it would directly go to edit line screen, okay, reconfigure, then always is directly landing up to that product configuration screen, reconfigure, then it would go to the code. Now, the third event is add, okay, add as it suggests is product configurator screen. So if you add product, select the IT Pro Pack, select it, then you would land up with this configuration, 
product configurator screen, but on the edit lines, this range on the edit lines, there is no range type. Like it, it, what it means is only the first time you are loading the product and you can configure it. But once it is added to the code line, you can't reconfigure it. Okay. And third one, third category of configuration type is required. Okay. This is always, this always goes with always only. Uh, configuration is always, there is no other combination. The combination exists only for a cloud. How is the behavior in this case? If you add product, okay. Select this pro pack, select it then it would take you to this configurator screen. It's similar to, I think, allowed always. I would say similar, exactly similar. That basically every time, required means that every time your product is added, you need to configure it. So one has, one is required to configure that, okay? So uh, this is a quick summary table, okay? These are the two, these are the few options on the configuration type, on the configuration event, these are the options dependent values. So as I was mentioning with allowed, always goes with three values, edit, always, and add. Okay. Then there is required, which always goes with always, and disabled, which always goes with always. Okay. This is the combination and this none and none. What are the things over here? Show configuration initially. None, uh, this, is, this is what we have been seeing, right? We are not seeing the configuration screen initially. So if we need to click on the trench icon and this. Correct. Then with allowed and edit combination, it shows me no, right? Because I mentioned right, edit means code line editor. You come click on the trend check and then you go to that configuration screen, product configuration screen. Allowed always is always you would see. Okay, whenever you select a bundle product, you are required to basically choose a configuration. Disabled means no configuration. Allowed add yes, initially it would give you. Okay. Required always, yes, it is same. So this required always and not always, just think of this both as same only. Okay, that's why they have kept this combination together. Then the next category added to Q, QLE automatically. None, yes, we have seen. Okay, uh, Allowed edit option, yes, we have seen. Allowed always, no, it's not added automatically, right? You have to go via the product configurator screen. Correct, disabled, so then they, it is uh, definitely added to QLE because there is no scope of configuration within this. Then we have this allowed add allowed add it is not automatically added right we have to go via the configurator screen and required yes again it's not automatically added coming to the last this one activity ability to add to reconfigure from qle okay yes when we have seen this none and none right that's what we have been seeing whole, whole time yes allowed edit yes that edit means nothing but qle Yes, definitely. Allowed always. Yes, definitely. Disabled. No, no, no. There's no scope of configuration, reconfiguration. So that's why no. Allowed add. In allowed add, you remember that we go with one uh, screen only. The Basically, when we add product, there's a product initiator screen. Right? Once we go, there's no option to reconfigure this. And required always is yes, you can do the reconfiguration. Uh, some notes over they have mentioned that okay none and none is a default thing okay this one same as none and none because all these options are same allowed always I would say this yes uh, the product or the company right which has a huge catalog and they are dealing with more of a um, configurable bundles or I would say nested bundles generally generally in most of the implementations I've seen that it is always allowed always okay disabled always if only in which you have the predefined bundles. Okay, that's why uh, where uh, people, they don't want the sales to touch those bundles on the code line. Allowed add, it's not oftenly used, which I agree. Okay, and required all, uh, required always, always the same, like both of them, they behave very same. Okay, okay. So that's the allowed always simplest. This is same how the required always works. How this is a nested bundle. Let me show you that. See, this product is IT Pro Pack. Okay, now within this bundle means firstly, first thing I would say, okay, I have options within this. So definitely it's a bundle. Now, why a nested bundle? Okay, because it is consisting of a laptop okay? and laptop again is having an option. Okay, so that's why I would say that this IT Pro Pack is a nested bundle. Okay, now let's see how this looks like a okay, nested bundle. We've seen a bundle. Let's see how nest bundle looks like. Let me go ahead and add ID pro pack. Okay, so net IT pro pack. Again, I have added some features. This is computer printing accessories. Okay, same choose one 
this is again with the time, this is minimum maximum. Now over here, right, if I select computers, right, within this, I have an option, laptop. As soon as I select this, there's a wrench icon. So what does this wrench icon again would take me to the next level of how to configure the laptop. So have you, you see in the behavior that, okay, from a pro pack, that was a bundle I added. And within that bundle, one of the options was laptop, which again, I can reconfigure. So that's why I'm calling it as a nested bundle. So if I suppose, just um, to you if I save it, showing two Q values in filter, because I haven't selected anything. I can do that because it's, it's again on the feature level, right? This is nothing but on the feature, I will post min max, that's it. So uh, let's just quickly see this, how the required one also looks like, or let's see, yep. Suppose this one, IT Pro Pack, let's just disable this, what would happen, okay? Now there is no configuration within this. You can't configure anything, okay? The trench icon is not coming because I'm done with this. So, like this is only, um, let's say, um, only, only when all the configurations are done, right? Otherwise, if something validation or some product rules you have defined, okay, then which might be hampering and you won't, and one sales rep or whosoever is creating the codes, right? They won't be able to reconfigure them. Then they would face a lot of weird errors on this thing. Okay. So most of the cases, um, it is all allowed on this, in which uh, definitely the it depends on the catalog of the company. This one, I think we have seen. Um, so again, are required always, as I mentioned, right? It works with allowed always. So if I try saving it here, two few configurations, two few options selected and options. So in here, okay, let's go with this. Let me just select anything over here and let me just But suppose a one scenario over here, it's asking me required, right? But let's say I have a processor, okay? It has same validation like this memory. You choose at least one. And I haven't marked anything uh, just selectable over here by default selected. Then this is gonna ask me to go ahead and select that memory also type that for the required thing you need to ensure all the all the nested components of a nest bundle rights they are recon they are configured there okay um i hope this is clear i won't go into the other option right you are clear about that always i add and edit what are the different behaviors let's since this was the summary slide let's go to features okay i think i already explained how what is a feature basically grouping of the options together See what's there over here. Products bundle defined. Bundles this one. These are some fields I believe they are asking. This product is separate. This option. What are the different, different options within this? Categories of the options. If you have a bunch of options, right? You can categorize like we saw from CPU, RAM, and all. Option constraint. Yes, definitely. Uh, we do have, which I'm going to cover in the thing. Let's see if it covers today or later. Um, what basically this nothing is that uh, you can have some kind of a constraints on the options. For example, you can, there is no point of selecting two, two hard drives, right? Suppose in a, in a feature of hard drives, you have three combinations, let's say 100 GB, 200 gigs and 300 gigs, right? So you, whatever your need as per your need basis, you will select either of them, right? Not an and. I want 100 also, 200 also, 300. That that nobody would do. So in that case, maybe we can have that, okay, if you are selecting enough one of them, let me disable the other ones. Okay. So that is an option constraint. And I'll cover that in later part, but just to give you an overview that okay, what is constraint. It's like constraining the options. But sometimes it happens that, okay, if you are selecting one option, uh, you need to have one parent option as well. Otherwise, there is no point of selecting that option. So that kind of things. On features, some fields they mentioned about that name. Okay, name, I think we saw this, that name, number, number, I was mentioning about the order in which the feature that is displayed, right? Generally recommended practice, I would say, is 10, start with 10, 20, 30, so that in later, we have some areas uh, or some numbers in between to add in between, right? But if you go with one, two, three, then a lot of records we need to touch, touch in order to accommodate the order which the business is demanding for. So that is number configured SQ is nothing but the bundle product. Okay. 
if you're creating um, definitely from a bundle product, this features right automatically refeed the population. This is nothing but a lookup. Uh, if you see the data model of this feature object with the product object, right, you would see that just the lookup thing standard. Min and max options that what we uh, discussed minimum is that within this feature, you need to select one, one of those options. In maximum, you need to select this is the maximum limit you can select as part of this feature list. Okay, I hope this is clear with everyone. No questions. Okay, let me just go on this over here. This mentioning understand how the number field controls the feature order this we discussed understand how the min max control the user experience setting max one will display yes i showed you this behavior right if it's max one the buttons turn into a radio buttons because we can only select one option okay uh, product options let's see this what's there in product options okay um option fields product options is nothing but we tried configuring right what on the like on the desktop uh, Basic also, we tried adding things and laptop also. We saw that uh, we have RAM, CPU, and all those are the things with options, right? Now, there are some option fields over there. Optional SKU is nothing but the lookup to the optional SKU that would be added part of the parent bundle. So, generally, in which uh, basically, in, if, in a, if you go to that related section, right, in the option, click on new, if by default it would select the configured SKU. Okay. And the optional SQ is nothing but you need to add what what do you want the option product to be added as part of this. So, for example, laptop if you're going and trying to add an option to this, you would go to that related section in options, click on new. The laptop is already added as part of the configured SKU. Remember, the configured SKU is always the bundled product, parent bundle product. Okay, an optional SKU is the what is the option you are selling within those with that bundle right for example laptop option would be cpu RAM, hard drive graphic card okay so anything like that would be optional sku an optional sku is also a product okay you need to create a standalone product record this is lookup so basically it needs a record id of the product configured in the system okay so that is nothing but optional SQ because this configured SQ and optional SQ you would see in a lot of, lot of objects also, other objects are also there. So remember configured is always the parent and optional is always the child within that. Bundled, this is a checkbox. What this indi uh, indicate in, um, in the product also, we had this. This I was mentioning that if you select this checkbox on the option field, what it would mean is that this is a related product is bundled within the main product. And one more thing is that this doesn't have a price associated to this. Okay. That price would be factored within the parent price. Okay. And if on the code line, if you're adding this, it would always reflect as zero. Okay. If you select this bundle. Required again, as the name suggests, it's simple that if you require this option to be configured within the product, then this is a required. Selected, which Again, we saw that if we want the parent bundle and we are saying that, okay, when we select this by default, select this option, right? That is the selected check. Now type, option type. I think we were seeing this when I was waiting for this slide to occur. So there are three things, okay? Now you've seen that how you can configure the options within the parent bundle, right? But there are different behaviors also within a bundle, right? Some products can be, uh, I would say, part of the product. Some can be, I would say, an optional thing or maybe in the cross-selling products as well. Okay. So generally, the cross-selling product, I would say, would come under the related product category. Okay. Let's see this one by one. Component. There are, it's again a pick list. Option uh, type is a pick list. First type is a component. What does this mean? Choose if this option, including quantity, is dependent on its parent and the quantity should be multiplied by the quantity of the bundle. So, for example, a uh, laptop is there. You would have a CPU within this. CPU, I would categorize it as a component. If I'm ordering two laptops, so that means definitely there would be two CPUs within that. Right? If I'm ordering 10 laptops, so 10 CPUs automatically. So I know that CPU is a component and when this option is configured with the type as component, its quantity also varies with the parent's quantity. Like one parent quantity, so one component. Two parent component, two quantity of the parent, 
compound uh, parent bundle so the two quantity of the option also okay then the next type is the accessory choose if this option is dependent on the parent but the quantity is independent for example when a user enter, enters a quantity for the product option it will remain same even if the quantity of the bundle changes right it's just the uh, negation of what the component was doing right like i was mentioning in the component the quantity would vary or depend on how the parent quantities are going on accessories it's it's a total opposite it won't vary okay third is a related product okay this is generally i would say categorized more of a cross selling uh, or up selling options for a given bundle right this it has nothing to do with as part of a main components of the bundle but yeah people generally uh, go with this that kind of thing okay so choose if this option is related but fully independent product used for cross sell or upsell product options that user can add to the bundle yet control the quantity independent okay so you see this is the most limited option i would say uh, then slowly that limitation is overcoming by uh, uh, relaxing the quantity constraint which this of component has and this one is totally totally free okay and the final is none which if it's if not populating anything by default it goes to the company okay we'll see an example i think uh, i know it won't come in the first shot but yes then again uh, there's another field of options percentage of total scope this is nothing again a pick list value what it is telling you that uh, how the dynamic subscription determines the product set if you want to further restrict the percentage of total calculation this is again related to the percentage of total calculation how it is there so if you saying if you selecting package so basically it would select it would look into the entire package bundle that okay whatever the criteria it meets just a quick info guys intellipad provides salesforce online training mentored by industry experts the course link is given in the description below now let's continue with the session it would do the percentage of all the products which categories means components is only the siblings component it doesn't have to be the parent bundle okay and both is like both component as well as the package one so because this both are independent it's only uh, the parent not its component and this is only the component not its parent so both is both so that's why let's go with this this component accessory and related okay coming back to this so they have given an option that okay there is a macbook pro option types of it for example a 2.2 gigahertz processor this is nothing with cpu as was mentioning right if its component relationship to quantity is proportional then behavior of the user like quantity editable in the code line no because why it is proportional because it would depend on the parent quantity if you are adding one then it would become one if you are adding five become five okay the next one accessory accessory is again i was saying that dependent on the parent yes but the quantity relationship is independent like parent can have pi but accessory it can be one okay there is no uh, relation direct proportion between the parent quantity and this quantity quantity editable this one is also not there okay it is example for uh, i would say warranty just an example and the related product is like if you buying macbook pro then you can opt for a microsoft subscription okay it doesn't have to do it's not one of the critical parts of that uh, parent bundle okay but so nice to have based on the necessity okay so really uh, this is not functionally dependent it's totally independent everything is open over here okay just to i think give you an example i think they have this also okay so uh, you see this screen right uh, over here what they have added they have added this it pro pack okay within this it pro pack there is a um, this macbook pro within this macbook pro again there are three components cpu ram and hard drive okay so this component the cpu ram and hard drive it's a crucial part of a laptop right so that's why they have configured as component okay and you see this one also right um, over here included the list price the student price this you remember that in one of the option field i was mentioning about with the bundle thing okay if you want me to go back you can go back again over here okay you see this option field bundle okay if on the option this is true right this is how it reflects on the code line so basically it is saying that okay 
I don't have a price of it, but when MacBook Pro is like 1500, within this 1500, I've already accounted for these three options. Okay, so that's why this included comes only when that bundle checkbox is there. Now, uh, coming back to the second category of the option type, accessory, warranty, okay, and the finally how this related product is there. Now, uh, next slide, what they have done is they have changed the MacBook Pro quantity to three, okay? So by default, I was mentioning, right, this component is crucial, uh, like it's proportional to, a proportional comp option component quantity is proportional to the parent quantity, right? So if I have turned this as three, by default, this would be three. Because you think, right, it logically makes sense, right? I Why I would have two MacBook Pro and only three, one CPU? Can a laptop exist without, without a CPU? No, right? So that's why it is designed this. But uh, the warranty, I think, so accessory was warranty, right? So I, I don't have any dependency on that. If it's three, let it be one. I It is my choice, right? I want to just have coverage only for one of the laptops, not none the other two. There's no harm. My product will be functionally working. And finally, this office subscription that doesn't have to do anything. It's just a related product. Okay. Uh, next they have shown over here is that independent on the bundle quantity. And finally, the related product, it, I, independent on the bundle quantity, free to edit. Okay. So only restriction on the accessory is about the editing on the quantity. So you won't be able to edit the quantities. Okay. But the quantity is independent to that. And related is total. Okay. So for IT profile, let's say 10 options. I have some things configured. Okay. Some are components, some are accessories, some are related products. Okay, let's start with this first of all. List it, then we'll go to the next one. So, oh, for starters, to do, to do, to do, as we have, we need to add one component. The CPU covers that one accessory. Okay, this is accessory. One related product. Let me. Okay, so choose this is a component, right? So you can choose one seven there. And storage is a related product, for example. Okay, so over here I have added a laptop. Okay, within this my i7, uh, the laptop's quantity is one, everything is one. Okay, let's just change to five. Okay, see my RAM was um, what do you say, component type, which you can see over here, RAM 18 is component type. Okay. That's why it is turned into five. But CPU 2.8 i7 i7 one. I have configured this as accessory. Right. So that's why it is not directly prorated to the quantity of this. But there was a limitation, right? I was explain, I explained you the quantity is not editable over here. You won't be able to do that. And finally, my hard drive, it's a related product, which is like no relation to this parent bundle. You can Feel free to play with this. There is nothing. Okay. And yes, I this was also one of the questions, right? You think RAM is included over here? I believe on the RAM, this the bundle checkbox is checked. Yes, this one is checked. Okay. So this one, since this is checked, so it won't have a price included. But rest others are included on this. Okay. Just a quick info, guys. Intellipad provides Salesforce online training mentored by industry experts. The course link is given in the description below.